of the Los Angeles Board of Police Commissioners. Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll? Good morning. Let the record reflect Commissioner Sobroff, McLean Hill, and Goldsmith are present, and we have a quorum. Okay. Um, uh, um, Mr. President? Yes. Uh, before we get, <laughs> thank you. Um, before we get started, I'd like to uh, bring you up to speed around the uh, hearing that we had last week mm -hmm. about data-driven evidence-based policing. Uh, we had a very good hearing with presentations from the uh, Inspector General's Office, uh, the ACLU, Stop LAPD Spine Coalition, and the Department. Um, the strategies discussed were license-placed readers, predictive policing, PREDPOL, Los Angeles Strategic Extraction Report, or LASER, the Cal Gang Database, uh, Chronic Offender Bulletins and Suspicious Activity Reports, and just as a follow-up to that meeting and to ensure that the Commission provide oversight on these important topics, I'm requesting that you, uh, as President, appoint two commissioners as liaisons. This is a subcommittee. As a subcommittee okay. regarding uh, data-driven evidence-based policing to meet with the Inspector General, the Executive Director, and of course the Department on a regular basis regarding these strategies or the strategies dis discussed at our hearing and to consider any modifications or improvements to those strategies. Um, also, um, I'm requesting that these um, efforts not be modified or changed prior to that engagement, um, that the Inspector General prepare audits on the suspicious activity reports for the years 2015 and 2016. Um, and I'm also asking that the Executive Director place on our agenda for next week's meeting a follow-up discussion on data-based, um, data-driven evidence-based policing so that the Commission can actually discuss any additional direction to the Department, Inspector General, and Executive Director. Um, I just also want to make the observation that in light of the um, recently announced changes to the Commission, I would imagine that that subcommittee would be appointed upon um, the uh, seating of the new Commissioner uh, in addition to that, I wanted to also indicate that um, it is my expectation that my last meeting will be next week so that um, it is likely that I will be here in order to uh, see at least this effort through to its conclusion. Good. So thank you for Commissioner, that. Commissioner, thank, yeah, thank you for the follow-up. I mean, the action step from my perspective is the appointment of the subcommittee, which I think is a great idea. Um, I will confer... Um, with the uh, commissioners and Mr. T. Fank, and, and I, we will go ahead and do that. So uh, that's much appreciated. And then I, as far as going on the agenda, we'll, we'll make sure that that happens as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And Mr. Inspector General, I assume that the audit on SARS is something that you can move forward? Absolutely. Happy to move forward on it. The only the quick thing I'd add is we just appreciated the opportunity to do that sort of table setting for uh, the last meeting on these general topics um, and give us an opportunity to sort of understand what the issues were and we'll be uh, better prepared next week as we further discussion to see how we can move forward uh, in our role. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Great. Mr. I, President, as to yes, item sir. one, election of officers, I would recommend. Mr. Tfank, your uh, mic I don't think is on. Uh, it should be on. My is it on now? Yeah. Mr. President, as to uh, the lack of uh, all five members of the commission being here today, I would recommend that the election of officers be continued. Okay, let's do that till uh, the next our next meeting, which is on the 14th. Okay, on the consent um, item number two, consent agenda items. Do we have any public comments on any of the consent agenda items? Yes, sir. We have comments on A, B, D, and J. A, B. D and J. Um, Mr. President, I'd like to move the remainder of the consent agenda for approval. Okay, that's items number C, E, F, G, H, I, K, L, L M, and N. I'll second that motion. All, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, so let's let's have the public speak uh, public speakers on item number 2A. On number 2A, I have um, Mr. Herman, and I have a card for Adam Smith, but it says 1A. Did you mean 2A? Yes. 
Okay. We'll take uh, item one now. No, sir. This is on item number 2A, Mr. Herman. Mr. Herman and Adam Smith. And Mr. Smith. Such deprivation when it comes to relative donations. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the tools that we allow the cadets to steal from the LAPD. What were the cadets doing with our equipment? We're the public, but yet you allowed cadets to steal our equipment. Valued simply at, for this particular item, 52000 Well, let's just round it off. $53,000 from the Los Angeles Police Foundation. Why were there no organization, policy, and procedure to follow through to ensure that the public safety off, is not off at topic. risk? So this is about the donation. You can talk about the other tools. during. Let, let me talk let, about let me the keep, other during your let, public comment. Let, 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 Go ahead. Such deprivation on the donation of tools. These equipments belong to the public. The Los Angeles Police Foundation has no right giving donations that indiscriminately, with your vague and ambiguous ideas, take it out of our hands to allow cadets to misuse the benefit of a donation. This is about the cadets, so let's go to the, and the next Metropolitan speaker, please. And the Metropolitan Division. Adam Smith. Please. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. You were about to be the shortest LA Police Commission meeting. Seconds. Nobody else. You can sit down. Nobody else can speak. He gets his two minutes. Put his two minutes back on the clock. I will weigh in with the city attorney. Is Mr. Uh, uh, what Herman? Herman? Is he? Uh, am I correct in saying uh, bringing the cadets portion into this is off topic? I can be wrong. Go ahead. It's off topic. Okay, so so you're finished. City attorneys weighed in. Those are off topic. Mr. Smith, your turn. Well, next time you hold the time and call it. Don't take my time away from this podium. I earn my time at this podium, not to jack it off. <clears throat> Morning, Mr. Smith. Morning. Um, so this is fifty-three grand from the Police Foundation. Um, and the report that's attached to the agenda it just says tools and equipment for this uh, red red team. Um, you know, I'll always come back to I'm still pretty new to this. I've only come into this meeting for a year. I just, you know, I don't know how these types of, you know, this giant sum of money can be approved without, you know, what, what the hell is tools and equipment? Um, and further, it's for this team that supposedly goes in to extract protesters. And as we saw a couple of months ago and found out last week that the charge is actually going through, we know how you treat protesters in this room. Um, with Dr. Abdullah's charge for, you know, nothing. So it's dangerous that, you know, there's no discussion about these consent agenda items. You just put through a bunch that... You know, there's 84 grand or so from the police foundation this week on the consent agenda, and there's absolutely no discussion. I just think, you know, part of the job, what are, what are tools and equipment? We just say yes, and we don't say yes, you say yes. I just, yeah, I just don't get it, um, especially when it comes to potentially criminalizing protest. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, item, we have a motion for approval of item number 2A, please. So moved. Do we have a second? Second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Let's go to 2B. We have Mr. Herman. Is that the only speaker on this? Yes. Mr. Herman. <laughs> this is relative to the donation of five ballistic panels. Mm -hmm. 
let me state for the record what our civil rights under the color of law are for violations of Title 18 U.S. Code Section 242, the privilege protected by Constitution or laws. That we, the people, relative to a donation for more ballistic panels or robbery homicide equipment, am I right, Mr. City Attorney? Are we, am I on topic the way you want me to be heard or what the hell I'm supposed to say? Because it's apparent that the suppressors are you, those who violate our civil rights when speaking on matters of importance when it comes to the department's report for August 3rd, 2018 for the donation of five ballistic panels valued only for $14,000, no significant number to me. You're better off putting 666 as a significant number. This way we can all be on the same team, same players. But it's apparent that the Los Angeles Police Foundation is biased, prejudiced, and racist because it doesn't allow us to speak on the privileges of donations. I have a donation, and it's just a word of mouth. Real simple. They got it right in NWA, so all I can say is, fuck the police. We have a motion for approval of 2B. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, let's go to 2D. This is regarding- 2D. Food supplies. We have Jonathan Foster. Is that the only Hi. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm all for, school? Yes, sir. I'm all okay. for school supplies for the kids. I'm wondering why it's only two grand. 2,500 bucks, is that all you got? There are 20, 20 something billionaires in, the United, in, in LA County and all you can come up with is 2,500 bucks for some kids. It's, I mean, do they not like you either? That the billionaires wouldn't contribute a billion dollars to you? For kids to for education I mean they must not like you either and so how do you change whether or not they like you so you can actually get some money and, and why is it coming from the Los Angeles Police Foundation why isn't it coming from the LA uh, Unified School District or why isn't it coming from an education entity why does it have to come from the police department and how come it's not a billion dollars you know, $1 billion won't bring a dead kid back, won't bring an adult human back to life. It's mm -hmm. chump change, isn't it? Sounds like a lot. A billion, and it's very small. small you, you, it's smaller than the space in between there, if you I squeezed it down. That's how small a billion dollars is. And so I would love to somebody, you know, start liking you, but, you know, it's, it's really hard, even though I want to. I want to <laughs> like you. And the billionaires, I think they want to like you, but it sounds like they don't. If they got so much money, they can't take it with them, and all that's coming out is 20. It may be related to the number of kids. There may be only 10 kids. So 2500 bucks maybe does well for 10 kids. And I still wonder, why isn't it a billion? Thank you, sir. A motion for approval of 2D? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, the last one with public comment is item number 2J. We have Adam Smith. Just one? Just one. Okay. Mr. Smith. Yes. Um, yeah, so not to beat a dead horse here, because um, obviously it doesn't matter what we say, but this is $12,600 from the Police Foundation um, and it's actually for surveillance and you know obviously things get approved nobody talks about it it's fine um, but do you think as our representatives up there as civilian oversight maybe it's worth doing like a deeper dive into giving further surveillance equipment to the Los Angeles P Police Department instead of just passing it along um, it's one thing if it's like dogs or you know, bloodhounds or horses or $75,000 for Beck's going away party. But we're talking about like 
you know, cameras. A month ago, we you had twelve grand for covert equipment or whatever for Newton Division narcotics cops, and it's like, why isn't there more of a discussion against putting these tools that you know are very likely going to contribute to, at worst, criminalizing people? Why isn't there any more discussion um, on that? I really think that specifically for you know surveillance equipment that's going to come through the consent ag agenda, it should be you know discussed at least pretend that you know the public matters to you I guess Thank you, Mr. Smith okay, let's go to um we have a motion for approval so moved all in favor aye anyone opposed? Three A. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna go to item number three A now. We have uh, staff here. Item number three A: Department's report, dated August first, two thousand eighteen, relative to the department's release from custody citations issued to persons experiencing homelessness in the office of the city attorney's homeless court program, operated by the Homeless Engagement and Response Team. Hard report. Um, We've read the report. Do we have, um, I have one question, but any uh, commission questions, comments on the report? Um, I thought, uh, well done. Um, I think it's the result that we are looking for. Um, I, I wanna just bring up one more time and confirm that none of the partner agencies uh, engaged in at any civil immigration. Uh, in this oh, this is three, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, I don't know. I <laughs> I get mixed up. Well, this is uh, the homelessness, uh, the homeless um, citations. Um, do you guys want to give a little summary? I mean, sure, yeah. absolutely. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I have with me today uh, Assistant City Attorney Guido O'Neill from the City Attorney's Office. Um, we're here today just to report back on two issues that were or two questions that were raised in our last first quarter report mm -hmm. back in May. Correct. Um, the first being on RFC citations, release from custody citations. Specifically what was asked are, are people going to court when they issued these citations? Um, are fines levied, and if so, what, what are they? Um, what happens if people aren't able to pay for these citations? And then uh, how many of these citations are actually going to warrant? Second question that was asked was regarding our homeless engagement response teams, the HART program through the city attorney's office or homeless court. The two specific questions were, um, what's getting refer referred to this program, to, the, to this court? And then secondly, what are the number of cases that are getting resolved through this program? So I'll answer these questions briefly, and then we can uh, answer any questions regarding the data in the report okay. uh, if you'd like. So um, back to RFCs, uh, are people going to court? The answer is no. How do I know this? Um, going to another question, how many are going to warrant? Our experience shows us, we looked at fourth quarter 2017, um, and 90% of those citations issued or went to failure to appear warrants, which means um, people aren't showing up and then a warrant is issued. Now, are there fines attached to those warrants? Absolutely. The average cost is about $445 for each of those. If you look at our data in 2000. 18 first quarter you're going to see about 82 percent are still pending but i think only because we haven't had enough experience or time between the time the citation was issued and, and court dates um, as time passes i would suspect that you're going to get the same experience a, a very high percentage that are going to failure to appear warrants um, and then what happens if somebody does come to court and they're unable to pay well, the courts do allow for the violator to ask for an ability to pay determination. Unfortunately, in our sampling of, of these RFCs, we, ha we didn't come across anybody that went to court and asked for that. So um, those are the specific questions uh, that, that we responded to regarding the uh, RFCs. Um, as far as the um, homeless court or HART, who's getting referred to homeless court? Currently, there is no referral, direct referral program for HART. Um, what they do is they host clinics throughout the city and the county um, and advertise and get pe people have to come to this clinic to receive services and then be eligible for dismissal of these violations. Um, so how, how effective is it or how is it working? Mm -hmm. um, in fiscal year 2017-18, uh, this program 
had a total of 617 people come and get intakes. Of those, I believe 574 were from the city of Los Angeles. A total of 338 actually participated in the whole program and which equaled 977 citations being dismissed. Now this is city and county, but if we look at the total, they had 31 clinics last year. Um, 27 of those were in the city of Los Angeles, which is 87% of them were in the city of Los Angeles. So although this is city and county numbers put together, I, I believe that the, the vast majority of these are from city violators or city, city population. Um, that, that is in summary what we've determined looking into RFCs and, and the HEART program. So um, if there's anything specific you'd like to ask about the data? Or, or I'm, I'm interested in, in the chief's um Thoughts on this? I mean, it's 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 a new day. What do you what do you see here? What do you um, what do you see moving forward? Well, thank you, Commissioner. It, you know, as Commander Troy indicates, we take enforcement action that, in our experience in the last two years, uh, is typically not resulting in the uh, individual showing up for court and and resolving the citation or the arrest. Uh, what is uh, perplexing about this is that uh, these are enforcement actions that are only taken after a series of, of efforts to get voluntary compliance and to seek resolution and to seek, uh, particularly in areas of, of blocking a sidewalk, uh, voluntary compliance. In the sense of drinking in public or an open container, it, it, we may have a, a much shorter uh, uh, path to enforcement only because many of those are not individuals experiencing homelessness. They're individuals that are that are just frequent in the area, particularly in the Venice area, as as tourists or as people who are just not obeying the 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 the, uh, uh, the rules within that neighborhood. Uh, what we look to do is to, for particularly in the areas of individuals experiencing homelessness, where we see this recurring nature of of after their failure to, or unwillingness to to voluntarily comply with with the rules and with the expectations as to their conduct on the, on the street or blocking of a sidewalk and so forth, uh, we would desire a time where the enforcement action could be avoided entirely. Uh, but in instances where it is occurring, uh, we need to, there needs to be some traction with the enforcement action taken against them. Uh, we are in conversations with uh, City Attorney Fuhrer as to also looking at the background of these individuals that may have repeated instances of these warrants that are now gone to warrants after, uh, after years of, of their uh, presence and conduct in the street, is, is there an opportunity for an amnesty or some type of, of clearing of the books so that we can start anew? And is there a way of levering uh, that uh, action to encourage the individual involved uh, to, to get back into the mainstream, to get back into mm -hmm. taking advantage of, so, of social services, including housing opportunities. And I know that that is the efforts of the HEART program uh, countywide. Uh, and the numbers you see in the report uh, uh, do exist, that there is some ability of that, but we're looking to move that up as a department in partnership with the city attorney's office to move this up to a much greater extent. We believe there's thousands, literally thousands and thousands of warrants that are sitting uh, in the system and that that may be or would likely be a discourager, uh, a d discourage an individual from, from taking a, a more progressive step forward. So this is a work in progress. Uh, I think there's a follow-up matter. Uh, we are also looking at uh, where these enforcement actions are across different ports of the city to ensure that what the department has done, what the commander has indicated as far as an enforcement posture uh, is one that is reflective of what's actually, or what actually the actions our officers are actually taking, meaning that there are areas of the city, uh, for instance, I'll use Venice Beach, uh, Hollywood Boulevard, those are areas in which we, the community is, is asking and business owners and tourists and others are asking for us to enforce the law because the conduct on the street has become uh, to a point where it's very disruptive and, and counterproductive and a sense of safety is lacking. Versus other portions of the city where the community is, is not asking for that level of enforcement and we can, seek, um, we can seek other avenues. And so where we focus our enforcement action should be reflective of the community values. This goes, you know, the extension of this is also goes to vending as, a, as a, another example. Okay, from the city attorney's perspective. You know, happy to uh, answer any questions about the report. Um, I think that our, um, 
you know, the amount of cases that we've had are, is going to go up, hopefully, and we'll be able to help more people out in this system. Um, with our grant, we'll be able to track the numbers better because we're going to upgrade our metrics. This is system. the HART program. The HART program, yeah. exactly, um, for that. So, you know, working with LAPD, I think, is a really good uh, way to go, especially with the older warrants the chief was talking about, where people have been out of the system for over a decade. There are probably hundreds of thousands of warrants in the system. Yeah. In the okay. System, so. Okay. Any other yeah, comments? Yeah, thank you. Um, Commissioner? Uh, for the HEART program, can you just briefly summarize the, the outcomes of the cases when they're resolved in terms of people getting services and housing? Um, you know, again, it's a little difficult to track that within the current system that they have now. They um, are expanding their, their tracking mechanisms and upgrading their computers now with their new grant. Um, I can tell you the different kinds of cases that they've done. Um, you know, things like um, lack of car registration and insurance, they'll work with service providers to help those people get the driver's license and insurance. Um, they've also done, you know, a, a kind of a wide variety, lots of driving violations, um, quality of life violations. Um, the service providers really try and, and gear um, the services towards, like if it's a drinking in public, things like that. They don't have exact stats on that. Um, but from overall, with all the service providers, people are clamoring for more clinics. People find it really successful. So uh, um, I think that kind of speaks volumes for that, that we, we can't do nearly as many clinics as we want. Okay. Um, well, I appreciate the report is very thorough. Appreciate you chasing down the answers to all of my questions and um, particularly being resourceful when um, other partners in other jurisdictions uh, weren't able to provide the information that we needed. Um, you know, I mean, it's just, it's frustrating to read this report. Obviously, I think it's frustrating, I'm sure, to write it, um, just to see the, the churn that just feels um, kind of, it's just not clear that, it's, that, that the whole thing is really doing any good, and certainly not to address the underlying issue that people are experiencing homelessness and that, you know, the, the things they're being cited and arrested for are largely consequences of their homelessness. And, um, you know, you guys are in a, the, the, the department's in a really tough spot, obviously, as the chief said, I mean, getting calls for service and people d demanding that something be done and, um, you know, but <laughs> it's, it's kind of a crazy system to, to cite people, to send them to court, they don't appear, then they get a warrant, then multiple warrants for multiple failures to appear, and then fines <laughs> pile up and creating more hardship for the person, costing more resources for the city, um, and then, you know, in the sort of random event that somebody ends up in a heart clinic, thank goodness that, you know, can get resolved and perhaps they get connected to services to begin to address the underlying problem, but um, even then, it's just, just you know a lot of resources to resolve <laughs> citations that the city itself is is giving in the first place, um, and no, cl no, you know, not a clear um, evaluation of outcomes to understand whether this is really effective given the the consequences on people's lives and resources that are expended. Um, so I, you know. <laughs> I don't quite know. Obviously, we're all struggling to figure out what the solutions are, and the department has only the tools it has, and, and those are not tools to address the underlying issue that's causing homelessness, and I certainly understand that and understand the pressure the department's in. Um, I appreciated the chief's um, work uh, on the amnesty proposal, and um, also, as we've talked about many times in this room, uh, increasing you know, creating alternatives to citations and arrests, um, particularly ensuring that significant outreach is done and attempts to connect people to services before enforcement action is taken. Um, so could you talk just a little bit more about that, Chief or um, Commander, about, um, you know, beyond the sentiment that we want to make sure that we're conducting outreach, certainly in um, 4118 cases and other cases, um, what is actually being done and put into practice to ensure that efforts are made to connect people to services before citing and arresting them? Well, I can comment on that. Please. Well, f first of all, um, with our HOPE team concept um, written in our, in our policy and our guidelines are that we uh, lead with services. Um, we talk about it daily in the Unified Homeless Response Center, so all of our HOPE officers or senior lead officers that are deployed to dirt certain um, CSLA rapid response locations 
um, are, are there with LASA or LASA has been notified of that location, so they're out there providing services first. Um, I've personally talked about it to all our reset officers within Skid Row at Central Division. Recently, about a month, month and a half ago, we had an all senior lead officer meeting throughout the city here at Deaton Hall, um, and we talked about not only bridge homes and safe parking, but also leading with services um, and uh, trying to connect people with services. Um, so a lot of messaging has been going on continually about leading with services throughout the organization. Um, most recently, um, we're publishing a 4118D notice that provides specific written guidelines um, that there needs to be multiple contacts with outreaches, reach, outreach education services prior to any enforcement action, um, and uh, that will go out soon, hopefully, um, within the next week or two is what I'm anticipating. Um, but those are the things that we're doing department-wide to message and to ensure that the officers are out there trying to connect people with the services, educate and do outreach before they take enforcement action. I've personally been out there on Skid Row, and I know those officers are doing it. I've personally been out with the HOPE officers. I know they're doing it. I've talked to several senior lead officers. I know they're doing it. So um, I, the message is definitely getting out there, and I, and I believe firmly that we are leading with services. Okay. I appreciate that and all the proactive efforts that you've taken on both training the slows and ensuring that... Um, outreach is done before enforcement. Um, I too want to thank um, both the commander and the representative from uh, the city attorney's office for this report and share uh, Commissioner Goldsmith's sort of sense of um, at a certain level it feeling like an exercise in futility when you just lay it out bare. <laughs> um, um, but I also, you know, as I you know, sort of feel or experience every time this topic comes up and every time um, uh, you come to the table, uh, a, a real need to contextualize the law enforcement response to this issue. I mean, the fact of the matter is, as law enforcement, we are not in a position to significantly alter the course of this human catastrophe. And in fact, we have to concede and to acknowledge that we are asking men and women um, whose, um, whose role in society tends to be very different to step up to the plate and to deal with something that they did not anticipate they would be so deeply involved in. And I know the department is doing the very best they can and at a very human level that you have officers that are out there every day, um, you know, facing in very real terms the impacts of a colossal failure of social services and society writ large. Um, I just want to urge this department and our chief to um, take every effort to refocus and to underscore the need for those entities across the city and the county to do what's necessary to actually deal with the underlying um, causes of homelessness because until that happens you know the mess that you know sort of gets served up um both in this room and the interactions many of which do not result in a you know optimum or satisfactory outcome will continue and so um, there are a lot of things that the department can do to increase its capacity to confront and to manage and to work through this um, reality. But the leadership that's required is really the leadership to support efforts and to encourage efforts and to validate the work and the, necess the necessity of others to continue to focus on this issue in a way that will resolve the issue of the unhoused. And uh, I wanted to thank you and to encourage you to, to continue to do that, Chief Moore. What's, what's the status of the um, amnesty uh, possibilities um, to reboot this, take our resources, move forward, what so, we know is going on versus going backwards? Right. So I have, I have a meeting scheduled tomorrow with uh, City Attorney Fuhrer. This will be one of the topics of discussion. Good. Uh, with that, we have a number of, uh, of our partnership with the City Attorney's Office is strong. We have a number of fronts that we're working on regarding 
um, how we go about uh, providing for public safety here. And, and I just want to echo the concerns of the commission uh, that this is a problem that we're, and the department is well aware and our men and women are as to the order maintenance that they're engaged in is really an, an activity that uh, is not meant to or and will not solve the underlying uh, challenge of, of the uh, of the ills that our officers are confronted with. The effort of the, the efforts, the efforts of the enforcement action, however, is part of what we can do as in providing for the safety within a neighborhood, within a community. And there are instances in which, first of all, the conduct, we stop the conduct by the enforcement action, which is important for others in a neighborhood mm -hmm. to see. There's a certain amount of expectation that others see as the fact that law enforcement not simply ignore or take no action However, recognizing that at best, this is an antidote that has a short-term response. We're not addressing the underlying problem is very, very much uh, on our minds. And as Dominic uh, Commander Choi was moved uh, to work uh, within operations uh, as a direct report to OO, it's meant for us to, both by myself as well as the senior leadership team, continue to stress the shared responsibility that we have as a city and as a region in addressing this issue much more beyond what law enforcement can do. Uh, in fact, as at 3 a.m. this morning, however, the police department and the fire department remain the most visible aspect of our region's response to homelessness. And that uh, must change. And uh, I believe that the, the, under the leadership of the mayor and the board of supervisors and others that we're seeing resources being brought to bear. We're seeing expansion of outreach workers and other strategies. Uh, however, uh, it is a substantial challenge before us and, and I unfortunately do not expect any short term or immediate fixes. So we've got to keep going at this incrementally though, and we will. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you, Chief. Public comment? Um, 3A. We have, I believe, six cards. So we have Mr. Herman followed by Audrey George and the Red Chief Hunt. We have seven cards. Okay. <clears throat> Ms. George, you can go ahead while Mr. Herman uh, makes his way. Go ahead. Morning. Hi. Just reading the report, it's just clear that it's not about that this um, cut release from custody, it's still not about ending homelessness at all. It's not about removing cops from any involvement in being a first responder or dealing with homelessness. It's, it's about people's, people that have housing security being uncomfortable by houseless people in their environments, it's about property values, it's about businesses worrying about the inconvenience of, of losing customers. If you look at the types of infractions and you think about the condition of houselessness, you know, arresting people for eating in, an, in a prohibited area, um, telling them they can't block the sidewalks but they can't have shopping carts. All of these things you're just stacking against them and there's no, no effort to really understand the nature of houselessness in the first place. The clinics that people are being referred to so that they can get their, their um, fees waived. These are clinics that make them, prom you know, make them commit to sobriety, things that just aren't realistic and, and that are unfair and, and show a total lack of compassion and, and understanding. We have to change that. We have to allow them to, um, to you know, these, these courts that um, the HEART program runs, they have to not tie people to, um, to going to places that are going to criminalize them, dehumanize them, and, um, and judge them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Herman. Such great compassion but we're still money short of $445 to cure the problem, not only to expunge 900 citations, but what are we doing in regards to the money for HHH? One billion dollars and we're stuck in a hole with homelessness, an eyesore to a population of Americans 
as I represent America first, fuck the wetbacks. And you still don't comprehend that because you allow such deprivation, character, and relief to a society of people that you've created, Mr. Developer. All these fucking developers have pushed homelessness into our communities, into portals, into McDonald's, into Jack in the Box, and not into Steve Soboroff society of rich, white, motherfucker Jews who take our money and abuse the public policy like they did to one man by the name of Christ. All because he kicked over the tables and he said, stop polluting the house of God. And yet you came into our homes and raped us, deprived us of protected speech, our constitutional liberty to life and quality and care as presented by the woman speaker before me. And all we want is a bite of reality. But yet our vi we've become the violators over homelessness. I've been homeless since 2008. Do you fucking care? Have you come out to reach out for me? I don't look homeless, but I have to be homeless in order to sleep in my fucking car. So I've been sleeping in the city of Downey City Hall in my car. Every morning waking up at four, sitting in their so-called station, showing them what protest looks like. A white nigger like myself in protest. The Red Chief. Followed by Ziggy. Go. Morning, sir. First, first of all, the Red Chief Hunt. This kind of policing is outdated. Um, as far as giving people tickets and, and making them trying to come to court, $445. I got officers out there giving people tickets that's homeless with no address. Doesn't make any sense. See, this is what we're talking about, outdated policing. You have to get the community to take responsibility for the community. See, everybody counts here, and I don't care if you're homeless, if you're sleeping on a sidewalk, or if you if you got a basket or a cart. Why is my officers out there writing tickets for bullshit right. instead of that's not criminal being homeless? Gita, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. This is the, the, this is not the way to take care of the homeless problem. Is to get out there and give vouchers out, four hundred and forty-five dollars. That's a voucher for thirty days. Then they wouldn't be homeless. You wasting all my court time. You wasting all this, all this time doing all this. Stuff. My office does the right tickets because you're homeless and you got a basket in the car and we're gonna send them to court. Now, how much money does it take to go to court to, to arrest somebody to take them to court and to see the judge? That's about like ten thousand dollars. That's that's like a year's worth of worth of housing. You know, but you guys got to get it right. The suits and ties don't know what's going on, and I hate to say that. They're not, they're not, if you put them out there being homeless, they couldn't survive. They could not survive. So, Michael Moore, please do me a favor. We're counting on you this time. Stop the tickets. Give vouchers out. Stop the court going. Stop putting people in police cars for being homeless. A warrant don't mean shit to a homeless person. They don't have an address. Come on, let's wake up and smell a coffee. Leave the homeless alone. Give them vouchers. Give them what they need, and put you know, and put them under there. And and Mike Bonin, he don't care. He's all about the money. He says it, 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 the, the pensions are, are, are giving them money to build a mansion in, in Venice. They don't care about the people. Stop, stop worrying about that. Give them vouchers instead of tickets. Thank you, sir. Next, Ziggy, followed by Jamie Garcia, Gina Viola. And Mr. Wayne from Encino. Morning. Okay, so first of all, I want to say this data in your hands is bullshit because rather than solve the problem, you're only talking about the symptoms of the problem from the perspective of the disease. This is a document about how marginalized people are forced to respond to the oppressor. Like, how can you guys not see that? Um, the data starts when people are fucking arrested, and that's ridiculous, and the sheer dumb apathy with which you all say, like, I don't know what to do, like, shows how criminally lacking your analytical skills are, or more accurately, how criminally profitable they are. Um, everything you have talked about, everything in this report is a product of criminalizing and profiting from houselessness. The fact that you can sit here, the people profiting from this problem, and say with a straight face, you know, yeah, this is a problem, we'll fix it, and that's just a fucking joke, and I just had to start with that. Um, Mr. Monopoly, Mr. Peanut, can you look me in the eye when I'm talking, please? Um, and also, you guys call them, like, city violators. Um, I'm talking to you, too, Mr. City Attorney, who does work for us. Um, 
and about enforcement against them. Um, and you're saying they block the sidewalk. You guys block the sidewalk. I see police standing on the sidewalk all the time. That blocks the sidewalk for me. Uh, you guys cause public disruption. You guys shoot people all the time. That causes a lot of public disruption for me. You all are publicly indecent all the fucking time. I don't know why a homeless person is being arrested for being homeless, but you guys aren't being arrested for, you know, uh, destroying the city that we live in. Um, and you guys are talking about, you know, the background against them. I want to know about the background against y'all. There's lots of, uh, there's actually a really high number of cops who are domestic abusers, a lot of cops who have murdered people and gotten away with it. I'm more concerned about that background than the background of somebody who's stuck living on the street. And you guys keep moving houses, people around, talking about they don't want them in Venice Beach, they don't want them in Beverly Hills, and, you know, they got to be somewhere. And you said uh, tourists are asking for that. Tourists aren't a part of the community. Homeless yes. people are a part of the community. Homeless people live here, tourists don't. If there's money to jail them, there's money to house them. And I guess this does pump uh, money into your lifeblood, into your system. So I guess it is appropriate to call it y'all's heart, but it is not ours. It is definitely not ours. And um, you guys keep talking about the underlying problem, but you, the LAPD, who has 54% of the city putted, you guys are the underlying problem. Thank you. Five seconds to spare. Jamie Garcia. It's Garcia. Morning. So, um, so when we talk about enforcement, uh, we had mentioned this in our presentation, and you know we need to remind ourselves how LAPD operates when things are spoken about in regards to compassion, not wanting to give warrants, wanting to provide services. Yet, you know, we have to repeat that um, the black community is five times more likely to be stopped than white folks. We have to talk about um, the black community is five times more likely to be arrested than white folks. Then we have to remember Kelly Lytle Hernandez's work from the Million Dollar Hoods Project. That arrests of houseless people continue to climb even in the first six months of 2017. LAPD made 7,740 houseless arrests between January 1st and June 30th, 2017, pushing houseless arrests from 17.5% of total arrests in 2016 to 19.6% .6 of total arrests during the first half of 2017. The black community represents the majority of houseless arrests, 37%, and majority of the houseless population. So that's what LAPD is doing. So I think we have to ground ourselves in what is really happening before we start giving ourselves these kind of accolades of what we want to happen. So criminalization is what first happens before any discussion about resources, you know, social services. And then even the discussion about resources makes me kind of laugh because I am a nurse and I work in a hospital and I encounter people who don't have homes on a regular basis coming from Skid Row. And when we even try to want to provide homes, to want to provide services, they're not there. And then what's interesting is that LAPD puts it on the city. It's the city's problem. It's the you know, county's problem. But we know, and you know, um, the young person that came up and spoke about it, we know how much resources LAPD takes. And you really are recession proof. And that's what we have to remind ourselves. Okay, thanks. You are recession proof. <clears throat> Next. Gina Viola, followed by Mr. S Wayne from Encino. Morning. Morning. So I am delighted to hear you say that LAPD should not be the first response to homelessness. I don't know what police are doing with houseless people except making the problem exponentially worse. Over the years, you've added more and more police to this issue, and the issue has grown exponentially every year and we look around and we make new taxes to deal with this and we wonder why is this getting worse why is this getting worse it's it's two pieces of a puzzle more police the problem gets worse more police the problem gets worse take that money and put it into resources that the community desperately needs services there are organizations out there doing work on the street they know how to use this money Give up that money that the LAPD currently has budgeted for for the homelessness issue. Give it to LA Can. Let them deal with the homeless situation. Get the police out of it completely. I am just be delighted to hear that that's even, we're starting to discuss that as a possibility. So thank you. We have Wayne from Encino, and we have two additional cards Ivy and. You're going to hear from actual homeless folks. They're gonna be coming up here after me speaking. 
So let's start off with the big problem here. Commissioner Shane Murphy Goldsmith got a homeless brother she don't care for on the street. And he getting busted up the head by cops all the time. And then we got city attorney Hugo Rossiter that falsely had Mr. Spindler arrested. His brother is homeless. In fact, you can find him outside a city hall crying for his brother Hugo. Hugo, he make $440,000 a year and he can't even give his brother a hotel voucher. And that's the kind of motherfuckers you got up here running this show. And then you got the billionaire in the middle, the bald-headed motherfucker <laughs> that was taken outside by Jesus of the temple and the money changers thousands of years ago. They threw his Jew ass out of the temple. And now they throwing us in the streets. Why? Because they taken away our goddamn 1978 rent control departments and giving them to developers. Throwing out 44,000 units of housing, there's your $78,000 of homelessness. This is a plan by design. And then they pushing these people west, west, into the first district. And behind Mr. Spindler's building on Coronado Street. One of them tried to attack him on Friday. But Mr. Spindler said, no problem. Oh, I'm just going to call my friend, Mr. Puppet. So I went outside there and I said, the Jew's causing your problem, brother, not Mr. Spindler. And he said, amen, and he moved on. No ticket, no beating. That's what you have to do. You motherfuckers sober up, cause the problem. You got a billion dollars, how's them all, you motherfucker? Ivy, and I have a card, I, I can't read this writing, it looks like Rushner, Rushner. Yeah, so these are, the, uh, these are the ones that came in late? Yes, sir. Okay, sure. we'll take these, but uh, for the rest of the agenda, um, any comment cards that come in late, uh, we won't take. What's wrong, you scared But we'll take, we'll, no, just, just follow, just, Put them in on time, and then we'll take them. Yeah, my card wasn't late. Okay. Well, we'll take it now. Go ahead. I'm listening to you all speak, and I'm thinking about the amount of violence that I've seen this police force put on the unhoused folks across this city. Um, I was born and raised in Venice. I came from there this morning. Just last week, I saw one of your officers kick someone's belongings out of their hands as they tried to get out of an officer's way. And then try and yank a dolly out of his hand as he was trying to move his stuff during a sweep. I've seen an officer arrest and detain a black man for not having a bicycle light. That is one of the citations in your report. That is something you burden people with that don't even have a place to live. It's really, really disturbing. The trauma that your officers bring to situations causes so much distress in people's lives. Your strategy is not working. And you talk about the conduct that is disrupting. This conduct is disrupting. The conduct that these officers bring to the communities is disrupting people's lives. All arrows are pointing to your officers. These citations, in my opinion, and many others are unconstitutional. I think you're driving a lot of our brothers and sisters to commit suicide. I have testimony of an unhoused man on Venice Boardwalk that said the citations mounted up so high that he, he tried to commit suicide. So your department is driving people to take their lives. That is on your hands. You talk about, Shane, the pressure Next and how tough please. it is for this department. You, you can get finish over up a during billion dollars You can finish up year. during public comment. Come on back at public comment and finish up. Thank you. I'm so disappointed. Thank you. Next speaker. Roshonda. Roshonda, okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that in the on City Hall in the East Wing entrance it says in order to govern you first must 
clean out your own back door. And I say that the city of Los Angeles is not doing that when it comes to the homeless. I am a homeless black African-American female. I've been intimidated, harassed, and threatened by your officers, which I call them the Klan, and please don't take it personally. I call you motherfuckers a goddamn lynch mob because of the brotherhood shit that you guys do to people, and you stick with it, and you'll lie straight through it. So if you hear me say fuck you to the police, it's not anything that's individualistic, it's holistic. And I'm saying it, and I'm using my constitutional First Amendment freedom of speech. Secondly, the Constitution does also state in Constitutional Amendment number eight, there shall be no excessive bail nor fines imposed upon those that are in disparities. So you motherfuckers that are still writing tickets are violating my constitutional right. And I'm all American. It's all American goddamn apple pie a la mode with cheese on it. Fuck you motherfuckers. Secondly, a person shall feel secure in their person. House sits such as my tent. Papers, everything in my tent, cars such as my shopping cart, and etc. There shall be no illegal search or seizure, no cruel and unusual punishment such as you guys implementing Code 4118, having these motherfuckers come out and intimidate and harass me on a constantly all the round the clock basis, and they do it anyway. An unusual punishment. This is a punishment that I'm receiving from you people the city and the government and their entities such as these police. And I believe it's unfair for the police to have to deal with any type of mental health situations. They shouldn't have to. There's not enough training that they could do to even be a part of it. That shit needs to stop like yesterday with that. And as far as African Americans go, we are the masses still. We're still receiving crumbs from the master's table, God damn it, like we're still in slavery, and we are. You get a felony, you, can't, you don't have the right to vote no more. What is this? Jim Crow law to me, God damn it. Still a part of slavery. This is bullshit and it needs to be addressed more than what the figures are. Is that it? Oh. Yeah, we have no other cards. Excuse me? We have no other cards on this item? I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. We have no other cards on this item? Okay, good. Uh, we have a motion for uh, approval to approve the department's report. Okay. Do second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, let's go to item number 3B. Thank you. Item number 3B, Department's Report, dated August 1st, 2018, relative to Immigration Enforcement Task Force Reporting Requirements and Department Operations as set forth. Okay. Good morning, um, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Again, let's, uh, let's first go to Commissioner questions because we have all read the report. Um, um, I, I do want to ask you to, when you do speak, to confirm that our partner agencies are, uh, are confirmed that none of our partner agencies are engaged in any civil immigration enforcement issues during any of the task forces. That's correct. Yeah, okay. Um, questions? Uh, yeah, I really just wanted to thank the department for the Good thorough result. report, um, the you know, tremendous amount of transparency here clearly. Um, and all the work that led up to creating the, uh, the notice that requires this reporting um, and that really clearly uh, specifies that there will be no coordination around civil immigration enforcement um, and goes really to great lengths to um, regulate and avoid that. Um, so I appreciate the department's leadership on that. Um, and you know, I think it would be helpful just to, to hear a little bit of context since I don't believe we've actually talked about this in a public session in commission. The work to create this um, was really done behind the scenes. Um, but in particular, you know, I think one of the most important things about this is, is you know, at the very end where you talk about, um, you know, in the event the department becomes aware that ICE utilized information obtained during the normal ca uh, course of task force investigations to further civil immigration enforcement, the department will consider withdrawing the involved department personnel from the task force. Yep. Um, that's, you know, quite a, a bold and critically important statement and just want to um, emphasize that and um, <coughs> appreciate any additional context from the department. Well, commissioners, uh, let me just take that moment. I want to thank uh, Assistant Chief uh, Bobby Arcos, as well as Commander Vito Palazzolo, as well as the members of the community that we work with, various community advocates, as well as the mayor's office, and what resulted in this in this notice being published and the resulting semiannual report. This is the first of what will be a series of ongoing reports relative to our task force operations and in relationship to task force operations in regards to various federal agencies, such as the FBI, uh, DEA, uh, uh, DHS, and so forth. 
in the 45 task forces that we have some relationship with, that number, while it may seem high, many of those task forces are, um, are multi-agency involving a very <coughs> few single-digit number of officers. But in each of those 45 operations for the course of the last six months, the organization, LAPD, and those task forces themselves have had zero arrests for immigration enforcement purposes. Uh, and that's whether it be for a felony or for any civil action. And additionally to that, uh, the non-immigration non enforcement actions of those 45 task forces have involved 603 arrests. And we, uh, and as report indicated, uh, in, our non, uh, in our task force operations that do not have a, an official MOA, uh, we monitor those very closely. And again, uh, same results in regards to uh, in, in, no enforcement action relative to any civil immigration. Uh, now, lastly, I want to address that there, there were 671 detainer requests during this period of time, of which zero were honored. There were zero interview requests by ICE uh, uh, of uh, any of our individuals in custody. And uh, lastly, there, of those 671 uh, ICE detainer requests received, we provided uh, no uh, notification of them as far as a person's pending release. There were two, in, uh, two instances of, of uh, Section 8 U.S.C. 1326A, which is the illegal reentry after a conviction of an aggravated felon. There was two individuals that were arrested over the six-month period. In the report, as indicated, one was uh, an individual that had a previous conviction for residential burglary and the other one for aggravated uh, felonious assault. Uh, so, and lastly, as you had indicated, uh, Commissioner Goldsmith, uh, I want to stress that the, our relationship with uh, DHS in Los Angeles is uh, very much an open mic and a conversation back and forth relative to their efforts, their roles and responsibilities versus ours. And Dave Marin and his partner uh, at DHS, uh, ICE and HSI clearly understand that these task forces are not to be engaged in any civil uh, immigration enforcement actions and that uh, results from these task force operations are not to result in them initiating civil immigration enforcement actions. To this date, we're unaware of any such action, but if they were to engage in that, then we would, it would seriously jeopardize and in my view, uh, no longer merit our, our work with them at this point. And with that, I would, uh, uh, Chief Arkos, anything else you'd like to add to that or before we start taking comments? Or Thank you, Chief. Uh, no, I think the, the Chief uh, in, you know, uh, stressed our, our commitment uh, to our, our immigrant communities in the city and also the commitment to our relationship with our federal partners and also to our commitment to the advocates that we work with. And I've, I've mentioned to you before, uh, we don't always get it right with them, and we, but uh, we do have a relationship with them. And I do um, want to speak very quickly about uh, the transparency in the report and something that I could have done better as immigration liaison officer is kind of reached out to these partnerships that I have created with the advocate, advocates uh, to let them know this was coming on this date. And uh, for the future reporting, this is a semi-annual report that I will do a better job of reaching out to them sooner on that. And, and also I just want to take the time, this, this report, this comprehensive report that was completed, yeah, I want to make sure I recognize uh, Mr. Alicon and his office of constitutional um, policing and, and policy and Chief Kermala's office from the Office of Special Operations, and specifically um, her adjutant, Lieutenant Mario Moda, who did a really good job of grabbing all the information and putting it into this uh, very comprehensive report. So um, I just want to understand, this is, um, and I uh, both commend uh, the department. Um, I know that this work was done um, with the significant involvement of Commissioner Goldsmith and um, Figueroa, I um, understand that this uh, is in lieu of the d a formal update to Special Order 40, but nevertheless is intended to underscore with the uh, significant engagement of a variety of partners and advocates throughout the city, the department's commitment to, um, uh, to refraining from assisting with the civil um, action, uh, immigration action of the federal government. Is that correct? That's, that's correct, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. And um, you know, with that said, I just uh, want to also lend my voice to uh, um, 
to the remainder of the to the, the commissioners who've been so deeply involved in this issue, uh, and uh, the chiefs also in the importance of uh, maintaining public safety and security in Los Angeles, with fostering uh, and uh, uh, fostering and um, and living up to the trust of our immigrant uh, members of this community in terms of their ability to rely on the department to protect and to serve them uh, without reference to you know, the massive hysteria that's taking place at the federal level around immigration. So I uh, thank you for your work here and uh, I'm uh, really impressed by the exceptional results of this effort over the last, I know, many, many, many months. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner. Good. Public comment? Do we have any cards on this? Yes, sir, we have eight cards. Okay. We start with Mr. Herman, Jonathan Foster, and Hamid Khan. Ron Fobble from the City of Los Angeles and Van Nuys last Friday indicated that the use of the word wetback is not unconstitutional. It's protective speech. All we're trying to do is allow a working it's immigrant attorney on immigration, rude. Mr. Wayne Spindler, have a job. He cannot work if there's no immigration relative to enforcement. We need good, hard-working immigration lawyers like Wayne Spindler, who has been denied work because this law enforcement not only arrested him once in 2016, but also arrested him twice for allegation of free speech. And don't forget all his immigration clients that you denied constitution protection under their civil rights and liberty. Whether or not we're wetbacks or not, we still have a right to due process. But I, on the other hand, in my red, white, and blue, representing Trump's star, we're gonna keep it. We're gonna keep the enforcement to hold back all the illegal immigrants and wetbacks that are pouring into this country, fucking it up. This is America, and not all of us are wet back based on your racial profiling because of the color of our skin. Some of us are true immigrants here under the so-called DACA, so-called ICE, so-called legal process. So don't trip out and use your typical method of racial profiling simply because Mr. Sobroff is white Jew and I'm a white fucking asshole who Next speaker, please. Jonathan Foster, please. Followed by Hamid Khan. Mr. Foster. Hi, I'm Jonathan Foster, and I'm a one-drop Choctaw. Not much Choctaw, but the Choc, the Indians, they, they wouldn't let nobody in here from Mexico area. The Apache, the Comanche, the Chickapoo, the, the Navajo didn't let nobody in here. They, they might have migrated up, but they, they went back down there. I know what the stories are. But let me say something here. Uh, for, is there any uh, LAPD girls with their high heels on? You need to get out of here because you're unqualified right Off now. Off topic. Something goes, oh, okay, let me get back on topic. The commission claims constitutional policing, which is a lie. He said that. Then it says it's a city police department and can make its own policy. Then it claims it's a public service, but claims that by state law it has confidentiality. It's totally crazy. Let's ask the Shaw family about immigration. <clears throat> and she says that they, there's a federal, whatever word she used. You know, uh, when I think about the Shaw family, and Mrs. Shaw was in Iraq, and George Bush wouldn't let her come home. And you guys are all letting people that really shouldn't be here stay here uh, under a guise of immigration that we're going to be nice. When, when, when you immigrated, they gave you paperwork. You can show you got paperwork. We, we shouldn't be dealing with those people at all. They're nice people. They came here. They talked to the people. We know they're not going to blow stuff up, so come on in. That's cool. 
but the LAPD also combined with the Culver City Police Department shot Jamil Shaw because he wasn't shot in Culver City. He was shot in L.A. And you people are the shooter. I cry so much about Jamil Shaw Jr. It's, it's been a, just a rip in my heart out situation. Thank you, Hamid Khan, followed by Carlos Amador and Louis Watanabe. One of the, uh, the most critical takeaway from our presentation two weeks ago on data-driven evidence-based policing was the assignment of criminality and presumption of guilt, uh, which is at the core of policing as well. And while uh, there's a lot of talk, and of course, you know, going back to when 1978, 79, during Daryl Gates' time about Special Order 40, about civil enforcement, I think the devil's really in the details, and that needs to be really just understood and, and analyzed as well. Because given the vastness of the information sharing environment, given the, the level of information sharing that happens, whether it's through the Joint Terrorism Task Force, whether it's through the fusion centers, whether it's through various other agencies, I think that goes to the heart of what we are talking about. Because on one hand, looking at this report, yeah, I mean, this is civil immigration enforcement. There was just no, no, you know, no participation in that. But when you start looking at now LAPD policing the metro, now LAPD increasingly going into apartment complexes and homes through the, the community safety program, what kind of information is being gathered? Where is that information being uploaded? How is the record management system directly hooked to the superior court systems? So I think it is this vastness of the information sharing environment that we need to know as to what exactly is going on, because that fundamentally creates a vulnerability for the immigrant community. That fundamentally creates a point. I mean, we spoke about vigilant solutions, and yes, maybe we don't know whether LAPD is dialed in uh, with, their, with their cloud services, but I think there's, there's much more details to be uncovered. And lastly, to, in, this, in, this, uh, the, 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 in this report, in Michael Moore's report, says in the event the department becomes aware that U U.S. ICE utilized information and talks about task force investigation to further civil immigration enforcement, I think that was the primary reason why San Francisco PD pulled out of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. And I think because, she, because of the nature of that task force and it Come back during public comment and finish up. Who do we have next? Carlos Amador, please. Carlos. Morning, sir. Hi, good morning. Carlos Amador with the California Immigrant Policy Center uh, here to speak on uh, on the report. I think one thing to uh, you know highlight up front is um, there's an urgent need to have all public officials in the city of LA to uh, take urgent and efficient action to protect everyone in the community, uh, including immigrants. Uh, reading through the report, uh, I think it raises more concerns and questions to me than any answers. Uh, one of the questions that comes to me is uh, in regards to the uh, 1326 corporations uh, that were signed off by LAPD uh, of uh, training people to ICE from the streets, from the field. Um, the question is, uh, for those uh, corporations, uh, what years were the initial arrests of uh, the people that were turned over to ICE? Um, and also, uh, in regards to the one case on the deadly weapon, uh, in charge, uh, what type of weapon was it used? Because it says um, it, it wasn't clear on that. So if you can answer those, uh, that would be great. Uh, I think we need to make sure that we have concrete policies that will uh, protect our families here in the city of LA, uh, including an a, a update on the Special Order 40, uh, something that really is permanent, that, or that, is, that is much more permanent than a, a chief uh, directive, as well as uh, a LA City ordinance, like the Safe LA ordinance that many advocates have been pushing for. Uh, so having meaningful conversations with advocates uh, moving forward, I know I haven't had any um, conversations in the past six months or so. Uh, so engaging in more of those conversations I think would be really, really crucial. I do have copies of the uh, LAPD bias free police uh, uh, policy that can be used as special order as well as the safe LA and I'll be sure to pass them. Thank you. Thank you. Lois Watanabe. Followed by Emmy McLean. Good morning, members of the commission. My name is Louis Watanabe, and I'm a member of the I'm an immigration assistance team within the 
Catholic Archdiocese of Los Angeles. And uh, I also a uh, member of uh, St. Monica's Parish and of the 8,000 families in uh, St. Monica's, uh, many of them uh, actually are residents of Los Angeles. So I, I came here, first of all, I wanted to commend uh, uh, LAPD for having produced this uh, first report. Uh, I think transparency is very important and um, and I feel that uh, LAPD has uh, making a good faith effort uh, to uh, report on its involvement with uh, task forces. Um, but on, on the other hand, I, I am a little worried, and, and the worry is that you know, there's a lot of task forces, and, uh, and a number of them uh, involve uh, homeland security or related agencies. And you know, it's kind of hard to find out exactly what's, what goes on on their end of the um, uh, on their side, and so uh, so uh, just because uh, uh, there's no rests uh, at the time uh, the LAPD is participating, is that my concern is that maybe there's something inadvertent that uh, gets disclosed. So so uh, I I just want to make sure that I express that concern um, as uh, as part of my role at, in the archdiocese. I have been visiting uh, Adelanto Detention Center, and I've also been to uh, Theo Lacey uh, to visit prisoners and talk to them. And uh, you know, just last week in Adelanto, uh, one uh, prisoner uh, mentioned that uh, he was actually beaten by a guard uh, because he refused to sign a voluntary deportation. Uh, order. So, uh, so these are kinds of things that uh, that we collect uh, within uh, our, our interfaith and within the interfaith community. And uh, so, I just uh, uh, want you to know that it's very important. This is very important work. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Emmy McLean, followed by Wayne from Encino and Yvette Michelle Autry. Hi, Hi. I'm Emmy McLean with a lawyer with the National Day Laborer Organizing Network. We need concrete policies and decisive actions that will protect our family members, friends, and neighbors in the face of xenophobic and anti-immigrant forces. We don't need half measures. A broad cross-section of immigrant and community leaders joined together as Coalition for a Safe L LA for All and advocated clear and necessary reforms. We came to the police commission more than a year ago, and we've engaged with LAPD over the course of the past year. Now, more than a year later, we have not come far enough. This effort was cut short with the chief's directive in December 2017, which was a start, but does not sufficiently reform LAPD policy with regard to cooperation with ICE. It, did not, it also did not ensure that even the limited reforms enshrined would last beyond the then outgoing chief. LAP, today's report demonstrates that more needs to be done. LAPD is turning people over to ICE after police encounters for minor offenses, which would not have even generated an arrest. Someone weaving in and out of traffic, apparently on their feet, was deported because of an interaction with LAPD. Um, LAPD participated in 20 joint task forces with DHS participation without clear limits or clear information about how many deportations resulted from these operations. The report cites that there was zero immigration enforcement, but there's no evidence that ICE did not arrest and deport people either during the operation or immediately subsequent to the operation. Because the task force didn't, didn't do the arrest doesn't mean that ICE didn't do the arrest. And criminal immigration enforcement is as concerning as, the, as civil immigration enforcement. It's the criminalization of migration that is tearing apart families at the border and that has caused such outrage. Um, what is as troubling is what is not shared in the report. LAPD is sharing information with ICE, putting information in massive databases, collecting and sharing information about the birthplace of residents, which dramatically increases their risk of immigration enforcement. You can come back during public comment and finish up if you want. Okay, the last point um, is that I just want to recognize that... You can come back during public comment and finish up. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Emmy McLean. I'm sorry. Emmy McLean. That was Emmy. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, Wayne for Encino and Yvonne Michelle Autry. About that report, huh? Let's see. 
I had a client I got a stay of deportation for in 2014, BIA appeal pending. June the 10th, 2016, I was falsely arraigned on a false arrest, received a false TRO by your city attorney, and my client was handed over from LAPD to ICE for deportation enforcement with a stay of removal and no criminal record or new charges filed. Transferred to Adelanto the next afternoon. Held, he would not sign his deportation, beaten in, a, in custody. New attorney hired, I fired. BIA contacted, 40 days later, stay lifted, denied, Ninth Circuit petition filed. Had to post a $7,500 bond to get out of custody or face deportation. 60 days later, false bar complaint against me. 85 days later, new attorney files false motion to reopen, denied bar closes complaint. Please put that in your file. Who the fuck do you think you're talking to? You don't think the people in ICE told me what happened? You guys routinely go out and refer names for people to be picked up. And then they get beaten to sign their voluntary removal even though they have a stay. And you've been doing this for years. Now, in my case, you did it because a fine gentleman of the name of Eric W. Rose, and you know who he is, right, LAPPL, the same person who threatened Cynthia McLean Hill's life a couple of times. That's why she's leaving. She's afraid of getting killed. <laughs> so that same motherfucker said he's going to put me out, and I wasn't going to have a bar license by the end of 2016. So please add that to your complaint. Next speaker, please. Next speaker. Yvonne Michelle Autry. Morning. Is this the last speaker on this? Yes, sir. Yeah, you, you should know me by now, the little troublemaker. Yvonne. Okay, go ahead. Right. Um, I'd like to uh, raise an issue that I have yet to heard raise, attacks on women, especially black women. Uh, I speak, read, and write Spanish, and I'm not against uh, Latin people. However, they tell me that they are under orders and that they are rewarded to break down black women. I hear them as they gather daily underneath my window calling me boca, boca. I know that they're mafia because they're talking about mano, black, you know, the black hand. Then they're projecting la culpa. You know, they're calling me por pasión, calientita, energía, por vampiro, daily. So these are the maintenance workers in my building, and I also have experienced, besides the Alexandria at the Hayward, and a number of other black women who have been harassed by their Mexican and Hispanic maintenance men. So if they're under orders by the Jewish uh, building owners or whoever is telling them that we are prostitutes to be broken down and used, many times they approach me on the street touching themselves in their mouths as if, you know, they're begging me for a blowjob, and yes, yeah, and then holding their hands like, oh, please, yeah, and you know what's going on. They think, again, I'm the sex goddess for a ladder servicing uh, elevators. They're bringing their sex gods from their countries, their blood gods. Many of them are vampires, cannibals, not just energetic, much like Jeffrey Dahmer, who was eating those black men that he raped and the Filipino men, and the police covered it up. This is a sacrificial ritual. Many women are disappearing, not just black women here, Mexican women, Peruvian women, African women. This is a global carnage of women. And so I'm here to speak because these men think that they can come here and do this. We have laws protecting women. Even single women are not to be used and passed around as someone's uh, uncollected or unclaimed property. So this is for the record, for the mafioso that are allowed here as cheap slaves for Okay. Is that all the speakers we have? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, yeah, before we move forward, I just wanted to do one thing, and that is to also acknowledge Chief Barco's comment regarding um, the failure to conduct outreach to the multitude of people who have been involved in this process over a very long period of time, um, and to uh, underscore that it reflects absolutely um, that a, it clearly was a mistake. B does not reflect any lack of either commitment to the process of collaboration or any um, uh, 
uh, lack of respect for and esteem and appreciation for those parties who've, who've put so much time and effort into this. Um, this is a commission meeting and it is, uh, I think, equally important for us to um, acknowledge and to bear some responsibility and obligation to make sure that there is adequate notice on items of this importance so that um, all parties that are interested have an opportunity to appear. And I absolutely concur that, you know, were this uh, done differently, that this room would likely be filled <laughs> with stakeholders that wanted to discuss this item. So, um, you know, the last thing I want to say about that is that um, clearly, you know, we're not perfect, <laughs> uh, far from it. Um, but trying on, on on this particular issue in, in 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 on this issue in particular, there is a unanimity with respect to where we want to end up, even if how we get there, there may be some difference of opinions about. But please keep you know working with us. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner, and I'll, I will follow up with Ms. McLean and Mr. Amador on their questions. I've been dealing with them since yesterday, so I'll, I will follow up. And get we answers. have a motion for okay. approval on uh, item B. So Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll go to item number um, 3C. Morning, everybody. Department's report dated August 1st, 2018, relative to the handling of the mentally ill audit. <laughs> Numbers 17-007. Okay. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for coming. We've read the uh, we've read the audit. Um, the last sentence is uh, one of the last sentences is the Office of Operations will implement process improvements that ensure tactical debriefs are rescheduled in a timely manner. It is circled and underlined all over the place. Um, do we have any other uh, questions or or comments? on this item okay do we have any public comments we have one card we have mr spindler okay spindler and my colleague yes yeah, so we're having a mentally ill audit and of course the number one mentally ill person is Steve Soberoff that should be on the top of that agenda. Because after all, if you're doing a report about helping the mentally ill, and yet you are fucking up more people and making them more mentally ill, that is an oxymoron for a group of morons. But what's the real reason you're doing this report? Well, you're doing it to get matching federal and state funds. Because as long as you keep generating all that paperwork, nobody read that shit. Raise your hand if you read that shit. Ah, nobody read that shit. They read the first page. So that's why you do it. You do it so you can keep getting the Benjamins inside City Hall. And then you take the money and you do things like hand out Dodger cards. And then you do things like take trips to the Middle East and Barbados so you can study more mentally ill. As long as you call it the mentally ill, everything is tax deductible. Yes, sir. You can buy a Mercedes to drive into the areas where they're mentally ill and it's tax deductible. You can charter a jet and fly to New York City and stay at the finest hotel as long as you are observing the quote unquote mentally ill. That's all this bullshit is on all of this stuff. It's just a way for you to get free shit. And there's nothing better than billionaires getting free stuff. That's right. And that's why all of you made Trump president because he's a billionaire and he get nothing but free shit. So let's keep right and roar and more reports. And if you would like, you could hire my friend here, Mr. Spindler. He'll write you all kinds of reports. We do have one late card, sir. Okay. Yvonne Michelle Autry. Pronouncing my name correctly, Yvonne Michelle Autry. 
is my name. Uh, I'd like to address the issue of the misdiagnosis of many people and categorizing them as being mentally ill, uh, deficient in some way in order to justify uh, the attacks that many of us who identify as targeted individuals are experiencing. Uh, many women, uh, people of color, uh, poor people, even Caucasian people. Uh, not only to boost the pharmaceutical industry and the psych med industry, but also to justify the illegal and highly classified, completely confidential experiments perpetrated on individuals, much like the CIA torture chambers, electronic weaponry is used on our vaginas, our necks, our backs, crippling many, debilitating many to the point of suicide, spraying our rooms with germ warfare. I come back to my apartment quite often uh, men or women or whoever is, has been masturbating on my door, urinating on my door. And when I complain, of course, they've already categorized me as being mentally ill, psychotic, paranoid, schizophrenic, and paranoid delusional. So no one wants to take my complaint into consideration. Most of the individuals who have been categorized as I have, and I do state and I emphasize misdiagnosed, uh, are either in the street all right, they're unemployed because they're not, uh, they're not employable because of this stigma, okay, much like that um, predictive policing, in which case we have been misdiagnosed, and then you use witchcraft, you use your, um, uh, your uh, microchipping, your subliminal programming to actually force us to commit the crimes <coughs> that you have already predicted per your predictive policing and your facial recognition of primarily black people with full lips, big behinds, or any other uh, features that offends you. So this has got to stop. We have a motion for approval for the item. Three C. Motion for approval. <laughs> All those in favor? Um, on items number um, that passes, items D, E, F, G, H, I, and J, are there any public comment cards on any of, thank you, on any of those items? We have comment cards on all items. We have one card from um, Wayne from Encino on each item. Okay. And then on D, we have um, Wayne and Jonathan Foster. And then on F, we have Wayne and Adam Smith. Okay, so let, Do you want um, me to call the cards? No, let's do um, Smith first. On D. And then I, what I want to do is when Spindler gets up, I want to let him just do all, all of his. Of them. Okay. Okay, so let's do, Sp let's do um, Smith first. Who's the other one? And yeah. Adam, uh, Jonathan Foster on 3D. Foster? And, and Adam Foster, Smith sir? on 3F. You're on 3D. Is this thing work yet? Is it You're on? up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I know what you mean, what your intent on is uh, for a gun buyback, but I don't agree. I think we need 320 million people with guns. Everybody needs a gun. And they need so much ammunition you couldn't shoot it in a week. Do you know who could take over the United States of America if 320 million people were armed with more ammunition you could shoot in a week? We could never be taken over. Right now, we can be shit on in, in, a, in about two hours. I need 320 million people with guns. And what I would like is that 900 years from now, they said, yeah, my great, 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 great grandfather gave me this gun. And we still have all the ammunition. Are you listening? We still have all the ammunition here, do you know that 320 million people never shot one round in 900 years? Is society in the United States of America going to stop shooting each other? We all live in here. I've seen all these people for weeks. Why, <clears throat> why are we shooting each other? Why is anybody shooting in Minnesota, in New York, in Florida, in California? Why is anybody shooting here last night? They were shooting. Bah, 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 bah. Why? Whether we had all the guns and all the ammunition, or if, if not, nobody had a gun or a knife except for maybe a butter knife. Why is anybody shooting anyone? 
We're human beings. Uh, hello, how are you? A smile. Hope you do have a great day. Where is that? Oh, they, they stole my uh, car and took all my money and then they t killed my little kid and now I want to shoot them. Pow, pow, pow. Why is this happening? Uh, Spindler on D. And I do apologize, sir. There was one more card on D, Mr. Herman. All right, yes, good point. First Amendment, Second Amendment, yes. So we buy back the guns. This is good. And as you know, my friend Mr. Spindler forcefully donated four of his guns and never got back his gift card. So on your report, and Cynthia McLean here wants to make a motion to give Mr. Spindler his four <laughs> gift cards for his four forcefully turned in, but turned in weapons. And of course, that's the plan. Disarm all of us. Make us all without our ability to protect ourselves under the name of political correctness. Disarm the gang members. Yes. And then of course, now we can print our own guns and our own laser printers now, says the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Yes. So now we don't need no gun store. We just need electricity and an internet connection and a laser printer and some nice gobbledygook to put in it. And then we have our own handmade guns. And now your fucking city council's trying to ban this onward technology, violating the Second Amendment. So that's what we'll do. Mr. Herman will make 20 guns a month. Mr. Spindler will make 20 guns a month. Well, after his false fuck-headed TRO is over in June 2019, for the record, we're abiding by the court doctrine, right? Of course. So now we'll make our own guns and we'll turn them into you for gift cards, $100 each to Starbucks and all of these other stores. Imagine the income we could make making our own guns and turning them into you fucking stars. Herman? Is he here? Okay. Mr. Herman. And also, Mr. President, Mr. Herman uh, has submitted cards for 3H, I, and J. So how do we approve the Second Amendment? Is it by a lynching? No, it's by the use of our tongues to come here and express what the Second Amendment provides us protection, not more police with guns, not more police with tasers, not more police with batons, the same way you used illegal force, United States versus the Baltimore Police Department, 42 USC 14141, taking action against people's civil rights and liberties under the color of the law. But no one respects the law. No one gives a fuck. You took away Mr. Spinner's guns President, so that he cannot this protect himself on back. the Second off topic. Amendment. This is about gun buyback. I'm turning it up into the problem, sir. I'm talking about D, gun payback. D for Dick Soberoff program. Okay, so that's, you can up. go on to number, um, what's his next one, his next card? For oh, this item, we have no other cards, sir. Oh, but what's, his, what's the next one he's got? Mr. Herman, Mr. Herman, sit down or stand up, but get away from the podium. You're finished. Thank you. I have the floor. You don't have the floor. Next speaker. Uh, Mr. Um, what's his name? Herman? You can leave the room. Miss, uh, will somebody escort Mr. Herman out of the room? I gave him a warning. Who's the next speaker on this? Oh, we don't have another one on this one. So, we have a motion for approval on D. Second on D. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. On E, we have two common cards. No, I want. Um, you have two on E. Yeah, they've been adding, sir. Uh, was one late? 
Oh, no, it hasn't no. been yet. Okay. We e have uh, Wayne and Yvonne Michelle Autry. Okay. Oh, Wayne coming soon. Spindler. Training and evaluation of cops. We need to train our cops better. And what you got to do is we got to train them in the new techniques. Number one, make sure the battery is outside of the camera. So when you turn on the camera, it don't come on. That's the first thing in the report from the Sierra Cedar Club. Now, you go and you beat the suspect, you got no video. That's also on that report, too. That's how you train and evaluate these killers that you put on the streets. Yes, sir. Now, when you train and evaluate the valley, now that's a little different when you're dealing with the wealthy areas. And when you go to Pacific Palisades and evaluate and manage that, you don't do those kind of things. You say, hello, sir. May I see your identification and your driver's license and your insurance? That is the proper way to handle a traffic stop in Pacific Palisades. But in South Central, it's different. Mr. President, the speaker's you have off topic. To, we off are topics, Mr. Spindler. We are talking about the training of police officers oh, in not. different parts of the city. In Newton Division, Mr. You, President, the you tell them to put topic their again, fucking so that's hands the end of this up. One. Um, Yvonne Michelle Autry, please. Yes, I'd like to um, stress the importance of uh, why I'd have to remind police officers to not reverse the culpability and actually incriminate the victim of violent crimes. Uh, many of my friends, mostly black men who have been assaulted, uh, brutalized, or uh, uh, hurt by police officers, of course, incriminated and then charged with assault or resisting arrest. Um, I supported them, and then when I was actually victim of crime, Mr. Uh, President, the speaker's off topic. Off topic. This is not about not, your it's about the training, experience. so that these police officers know so that they are to go serve ahead and, if you're and off, to protect. If you continue to be off topic, then this no, is no. not about training, Miss Autry. This is about a management system. To it's called training, evaluation, and management system. It is a contract for professional services for that. Where is that in? So that's management. So that would implement the training and it would involve or no, directly it's a influence management just program, well, what is the programming and training the officers that are to serve and protect and not violate and so you want to and go murder. ahead. Why don't you go right, ahead and right. then if you're off topic you again, you haven't destroyed then we'll, the brain we'll completely with that. your lasers and your microwaves, have you? It's not completely, it's not, yeah, it's, I'm not completely like brain dead. That's what you're trying to do, you know, a rope-a-dope here. Right, these officers continually incriminate the victims. So you need to implement, again, reminding them to serve and protect all, not just the rich or the Jewish or the white or your house Negroes, but all. Okay, thank you for your comments. Do we have ability? Okay, we have no other sacrifice, comments. and that will not be Disrupting covered up here on my watch. God is watching you too. And ask you to leave. We have no other cards on item three e. Okay, we have a motion for approval. Second. All in favor? All right. Do you have two comments on F? We have three. No. Adam Smith, Wayne from Encino, and Yvonne Michelle Autry. Uh, so this is for the agreement between the city of LA and R&D systems for video monitoring system maintenance. Um, according to the report attached, it's up to the contracts worth up to $10 million. Um, and this contract's been happening for years as far as I can tell. So I'm wondering what is this $10 million potential $10 million being spent on specifically the report doesn't specify which cameras. It talks about closed circuit TV, wireless camera systems, security management systems. Um, and I guess I'm thinking about specifically the June report from the IG's office, the LAPD's jail and holding tank structures and procedures. Because if this maintenance contract worth $10 million is happening every year, um, is there a 
any connection between your audit of of the the holding tank structures and procedures and all that um and how this money is being utilized because uh if this maintenance contract was happening in March of 2016 when Waukesha Wilson was killed and we're still inexplicably missing those 22 minutes what is this 10 million dollar contract going towards in terms of you know how it's fitting into all the problems that you've found in the jails and the holding to, in the holding cells and everything um but yeah it's just troubling that the report attached to this doesn't actually specify you know this city as we know is full of cameras um and it just doesn't specify where this ma- this money is being applied to in terms of maintenance so your your question you've asked we can hold the clock you've asked it a few times is our jails included in this is that your question i mean it's one of them so so this contract is a uh, an effort for the city to for the department to be able to enter into an agreement with a contractor to come in and we have various camera systems as you've indicated and to repair those there are a number of them that uh, that uh, break or, or become obsolete, and this is an ongoing maintenance agreement with them. I would expect that it would include uh, efforts mm-hmm. with the jail division. I will also relay, as been stated earlier, the department has made efforts in the last uh, number of years to replace the video systems within all of its jails that are antiquated and out of date. This contract does not provide for the replacement. This contract merely is maintaining existing systems. The the organization has to operate separately for for new systems. Thanks, Chief. Okay, you can use the remaining time. Go ahead. So there's $10 million going to maintain cameras that aren't working, obviously. Okay. Yvonne Michelle Autry. Just, just for the record, I don't believe this is a, a ten million dollar contract, but I'll yeah. we'll follow up with you, sir. Okay, okay, yeah. Yes, I'm so glad that you did bring up Waukesha Wilson. So there, uh-oh. where is your money? Need more um, uh, better microphones? Yeah, to cover up again that sacrifice of that young black woman who was incriminated, probably ritualistically raped um, before so you're the. Off, off topic. I'm not off topic yeah. because where was the video? Where was that video? Where was that video? Okay, right. So this is ridiculous. I'm a black woman. I'm continually harassed and stalked with um, attempts on my life, possibly by mafia. Yeah, low-level Illuminati. You're one level of the Illuminati. The mafia is another level of Illuminati. These okay, are just pawns. Off topic again. No, I'm not Next speaker, because please. the vic- of black women so the you're, majority oh, you're disrupting the meeting now i'm going to ask you to stop disrupting the meeting or i'm going to ask you to leave the room i'm giving you every chance to stop without me having to ask you to leave so you're not going to stop you can come back in public comment Okay, so I'm asking her to leave. Next speaker, please. We're asking you to leave the room now. Thank you, officers. Okay, gotcha. Okay, thank you. Mr. Spindler. Wayne from Encino, please. Yeah, so much. That's right. For for the record. Yes, I'd like you to leave the room. Yes, for the record, she called you a house nigger. Yes. So that's right. Lots of hatred here in the room. Yes, sir. So $10 million. Congratulations. You stole another $10 million from the federal government. I applaud you. Let's give them an applause. $10 million. And while you're stealing the money, you're lynching a black woman at the same time. A twofer, that's what they call it there at Pacific Palisades, yes, sir. So when everybody asks what the commission did today, what'd they do today? Well, they lynched a black woman and stole $10 million more. A successful meeting. Yes, sir. And for the record, Miss Autry said, fuck you. Yes, sir. So RD on Systems. Well, no. RD Systems on topic. Right, Mr. T-Pang? Right. 
And you know, RD Systems makes video monitoring of Miss Autry's arrest. That's right. RD Systems is downloading into the cloud her lynching. He's off topic, sir. That's right. That's the end of this one. Um, we have a motion for approval on this item. We have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Okay, so now we're, we're what are we on now? Okay. Um, F. Game. We've done. We're on G. G. And okay. we have um, Mr. Spindler for G, H, I, and J. Okay, Spindler, you can do all of them. G, H, I, and J. This is number G. This is G. All right, now G, stay on the fucking topic. All right, all right. Go ahead. All right, yes, sir. G, backlog of the DNA capacity enhancement. Now you see what happens. They rape a woman, and they hold back the evidence for two entire years. You know why they do it? Because the statute of limitations is two years. That's right. So that's why we let women get raped legally in the city of Los Angeles, because we off, don't have topic, rape kits. Spindler, we're talking about a contract here. A contract to do rape kit reduction. And the reason that you allow the goddamn backlog of rape kits in the first place is so your friends can rape the bitches okay, so within the two years. You want to go on to H now, Spindler? Let's get on. Let's get on. Real estate fraud. Steve Soboroff's favorite subject is real estate fraud. Yes, that's how he made his money. Stealing, on stealing. Get on topic, Spindler. Well, that's what you do. You're the king of real estate fraud. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to I. That's right. What do we got on I, sir? <laughs> what do we got there on I, sir? Oh, the Elvis Presley Institute of Criminal Investigations. Yes, sir. Robert Presley, the illegitimate son of Elvis Presley, wants to give money to criminal investigation Off courses. Topic, Off topic, Spindler. Well, you want to do criminal investigation courses, right? Don't you want to know what we're offering here at the Presley Institute? Number one, how to beat suspects and not Off get topic, sued Mr. civilly. Topic. Let's go to number J now, Spindler. Yes. And then we have, well, you go ahead, sir. Yes, I'll take this one. <laughs> For the equine veterinarian services for the horses. Charlie Beck's horse is in the equine veterinary topic, services. Off topic. How in the hell is providing horse care in this horse shit department not on the equine veterinarian services? Equine means horses and donkeys and jackasses. Off topic, Off topic. thanks. For the okay, I mean, we have a motion, for, a motion for approval of items. Let's see where we start here. G, G H I and J. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Second. Anyone opposed? Okay. Do you want to announce the arrival of... Please let the record reflect Commissioner Figueroa Villa is now present. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you ready? Chief. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Chief. For my report, uh, let me first start with the significant events. Uh, during this period from July 17th to August 7th, we had two officer-involved shootings, and I'm going to give a brief uh, overview of... First being on the 27th of July at, 20, at uh, 1015 at night, uh, uniform officers assigned a mission patrol division was, were conducting an investigative vehicle stop in front of the 9400 block of Noble Avenue. Uh, the, su the subject of the stop was a known gang member and was suspected of being on federal probation. Uh, the officers approached the individual who was the driver and sole occupant of his vehicle. Upon making contact, the officers <laughs> verbally confirmed that he was, in fact, still on federal probation and requested that he step out of the vehicle. When he did, the individual produced a handgun, a semi-automatic pistol, and without warning began firing shots at both officers, resulting in an officer-involved shooting. Uh, one officer was struck by one of the rounds fired by the individual. Uh, she received uh, medical care at the scene, uh, as well as was transported to a nearby hospital where she was treated for a gunshot wound to her leg. And uh, 
The, uh, fortunately, her partner officer was able to render, render aid, and he was not struck. Uh, the individual who, f who shot at our officer uh, was struck by multiple rounds fired by, uh, by the, uh, one of the officers present. Uh, he received medical care from the, from the fire department at scene and was transported to a, a local hospital where he remains in critical condition. A 380 caliber semi-automatic pistol was recovered from the scene. Uh, I responded to this event on the evening that of its occurrence. I visited the involved officer who was shot uh, at the hospital as well as days later. Uh, I'm happy to report that she's expected to fully recover after a long uh, rehabilitation. Uh, I also uh, observed the video, the body-worn video, uh, which will be subject of a release uh, con consistent with uh, the Commission's uh, direction. I'm thankful that this officer uh, survived this attack. Mm -hmm. uh, two days later, on the 29th, at approximately 10 o'clock at night, in a different part of the city, uh, Southwest Patrol officers were handling a radio call and were standing on the south side of the 29th Street, just west of Normandy Avenue. As the officers conducted their investigation, the driver of a red Toyota Rave 4 traveling southbound on Normandy Avenue uh, began firing a handgun multiple times uh, uh, Im immediately outside before making a westbound turn on the 29th. The officers perceived they were being fired upon and an officer-involved shooting occurred. The, the suspect's vehicle continued west past the officers and then south on Brighton Avenue where it was abandoned. A perimeter was established and Metropolitan and canine and SWAT personnel responded and conducted a search. Uh, unfortunately, the individual mm -hmm. was not located. Uh, a female passenger uh, was inside the vehicle uh, at the time of this attack. Uh, she reported that she was a victim of a, a kidnap and uh, in the stolen vehicle and uh, we are uh, unfortunately I will report that she was uninjured in this event. Uh, there's no evidence also to suggest the suspect was hit by the officer's gunfire and uh, it's fortunate that again no officers were injured during this incident. Uh, also during this time, I uh, want to report that on the 31st, last Tuesday, I held a press conference. It was in regards to the release of uh, critical incident video involving the, uh, a shooting, in, uh, an officer involved shooting on June 16th. Uh, I used the occasion, uh, however, to frame the uh, instances of our 2017 use of force report. Uh, this, as I recall, the commission was a report uh, presented to this body approximately a month and a half ago. Uh, a number of questions were uh, brought to the department's attention uh, relative to uh, an increase in the number of officers firing in each of the 44 instances, the average, if you will, of how many officers uh, fired in each officer-involved shooting, as well as the average number of rounds. We saw that there was an increase uh, in 2017 from the year before. And our hit ratio, the accuracy of our rounds, uh, was at a five-year low. Uh, and finally, that our suspects uh, involved in our officer-involved shootings, that the number of officer-involved shootings where edged weapons or impact weapons were used in place of a mm -hmm. firearm also increased. Uh, the organization began looking uh, at the results of these, uh, of these uh, data points, if you will, as we were assembling the 2017 report. So we've had a couple months to, to look at that, and I wanted to, on the 31st, uh, to announce the, uh, that in addition to the commission identifying this, that we had investigated and looked at a couple of key aspects that we believe may be, um, may be having an influence on these, on these data points. Uh, first and foremost <coughs> is we saw that the, in the number of officers involved shootings that it had the increased in an average number of officers involved, that, we, uh, that the command and control at those scenes, uh, fire discipline, the, uh, the number of officers that are given to the task of being a lethal control or lethal cover officer uh, that we we wanted to improve our training so we developed a training bulletin and I'm happy to uh, state that that bulletin was released this last week uh, that goes into uh, details reinforcing the expectations of the organization of myself uh, of the leadership that as officers arrive on these scenes uh, that they uh, work as a team that they uh, improve their communication of what task or role each of them will take. And the effort here is to reduce the overdeployment or the spontaneous deployment of, of lethal cover officers. The hopes of that is that uh, to afford the safety of both the officers as well as uh, everyone else involved. Uh, 
What's critical to note is that of the nine instances last year of which four or more uh, officers were involved in that individual shooting, <clears throat> that in eight of those instances, uh, the suspect, the individual, was armed with a firearm. Uh, and in five of those uh, instances, the suspect or the individual pointed that weapon or fired that weapon at the officers. So the increase in these multiple officer shooting incidences are involving instances in which the individual, the suspect, is actually presenting a firearm in the vast majority of cases. So our, our balancing act here is providing officers with training and confidence that they'll work as a team and that we will afford them the ability to, to protect themselves as well as others. But we want to do that in a manner that, uh, that doesn't result in an over-deployment or a spontaneous deployment of more officers than needed for the nature of the threat. So that command and control bulletin, the video which I'll make available for the commission, I encourage you to spend a few moments uh, to watch it, I think reinforces these concepts uh, that I've just mentioned. Additionally, uh, this will be the first of a series of videos, uh, and I'm proud to say that in this video that we produced in a relatively short period of time, uh, also incorporated uh, body-worn videos of a previously adjudicated use of force that reinforced the positive aspects of good, de uh, good control, good scene control, good uh, deployment of personnel and assigned tasks uh, in an effort to manage a, a volatile situation. One other area, uh, and this training, by the way, will continue into the months ahead. We're by no means done. Uh, this, is a, this will be an ongoing effort, but it'll be an area of focus that, that I intend uh, for the organization to, be, uh, to remain on for the rest of this year. Uh, secondly, and this was probably um, demonstrated yet again on our most recent critical incident video this past Saturday, uh, where an individual who had uh, reportedly or allegedly stabbed his wife uh, in the Porter Ranch area of the San Fernando Valley, uh, and officers responded to that event and uh, att attempted to use a taser uh, as well as a beanbag shotgun. And that beanbag shotgun is observed on the video striking the individual a number of times, and unfortunately it did not stop his uh, approach as he, appro as he uh, came upon the officers. And while I cannot judge or will not make a statement relative to the merits of that shooting, the performance of that weapon system in that time is something that I echoed last week, which is, as we've seen in the last four years, in expanding the use of a beanbag shotgun and to placing it in more vehicles was an effort to allow officers to have alternatives, effective alternatives to an individual armed with a knife or a blunt object. And what we see today is that that equipping of our officers and training has resulted in officers utilizing that system and in the vast majority of the time overcoming the resistance and not having to resort to deadly force. However, when it doesn't work, uh, it is when we are seeing people, officers having to resort to use of force. Uh, anecdotally, as we look back at that weapon system 10, 15 years ago, uh, it struck us that one or two rounds of that being fired would prove effective in overcoming the resistance. We're now seeing multiple rounds, two, three, four, five rounds uh, being fired and the suspect being, the individual being able to, to resist that and, and not being overcome by that force. So I'm proud of our training, uh, training division and uh, professional, or, um, police science and training bureau uh, because they have saw this coming and have been investing and reviewing. As you know, the department's been working with a 40 millimeter uh, 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 weapon system mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. increased the size of the beanbag. It becomes like a uh, like a size of a. It's called a sponge round. It's about the size of a tennis ball, which, when it's deployed, increases the impact on the suspect while lessening the risk to the individual of any serious injury. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a it's also a weapon system that we learned that with properly aligned with sights. Uh, allow an officer a greater standoff distance. Instead of 10 to 45 feet, this weapon system can be used 100 feet away mm. with a sighting system that allows for a more accurate placement. Mm. So we have placed uh, 210 mm. of the, 215 of those in our uh, stations. Each station has 10 of those as well as we've uh, given uh, two to, to SIS and we have one in reserve. We have another uh, nearly 200 coming to the organization and the effort will be for us to, in our less lethal uh, tool set or arsenal, is to transition to that weapon system. 
This, I believe, speaks well for the organization because it continues to demonstrate that our effort is to continue to improve. And as we've adapted with less lethal tools, both the taser as well as the beanbag, in the last four years to improve uh, our ability to control circumstances and lower the risk of having to resort to deadly force, that as we've seen things that have not had the desired outcome, that we make adjustments. As a reminder, the taser, two, a year and a half ago, we changed out the dart set because we believe that the darts that were being used were not long enough and were not having a great enough impact. So our latest chapter, which is I'll talk, I'm talking about today, was this press conference last week uh, that spoke about these issues and I felt it was, uh, it was worthwhile to uh, inform the commission uh, relative to our work in that arena. Chief, people aren't getting tougher or working out more. It's, it's the drugs or why aren't, why aren't they as effective? Well, that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the million dollar question. The reality is that sometimes they're able to defeat it by heavier clothing or by picking up uh, a trash can lid or, or other, mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. things to defend against the round. Uh, I believe that there are people, uh, individuals mm -hmm. that we've come across that are more aware of weapon systems that we have and might utilize in, in our engagement with them as an effort to overcome their resistance. Uh, there are oftentimes individuals that are under the influence of drug or narcotics or, or have mental Ill, mental, are suffering from mental illness. Uh, so there's a variety of issues. But for us, uh, the, the desire is, again, as we make efforts to de-escalate and then manage and control the situation with the least amount of force, is how do we, uh, how do we improve systems that when we see them falling short and what adjustments do we need to make in order to uh, improve the outcomes as well as assure the safety of our officers and, and innocent bystanders and others, including the, the individuals themselves. Uh, I want to move over, if, I, uh, if you would, uh, now to our crime uh, picture. Uh, as we uh, ended this last week, we continue to have a reduction in overall violent crime, including uh, each, each category of violent crime. Uh, we have, uh, and that's a 2.5% reduction year to date. We have a 2.7% reduction in property crime. Uh, there is an issue I'm, I will continue to ask the public's assistance, and that is our, our theft from vehicles. Uh, we saw a, we're basically even for the year, uh, but that was a number that we had seen up to the last month or so, a good decrease uh, one year over the other. The uh, point there is in that arena, as well as personal thefts, is prevention is uh, people locking it, locking items of value, hiding those, or secure, uh, putting them in a place where uh, they're not so easily found or observed, uh, where people can uh, victimize them. That's a significant area for us because prevention is far more effective than uh, efforts of enforcing or, or uh, trying to arrest our way out of this. Moving quickly through the other uh, attributes of our crime picture, our shootings uh, continue to be down this year versus last. We have 61 fewer shooting victims this year versus last. Uh, that's a 9.5% reduction from last year and a 12% reduction from a two-year period. Uh, our gang crime is also down 14%. Uh, interestingly, in the sense of our gang homicides are down nearly 15%, uh, so where homicides are occurring this year, it appears that our gang crime is actually not having a significant of amount of impact on, on violence as it has in years prior, past. Uh, we'll continue to attribute, we believe that we're a portion of that solution as well as our efforts at intervention and prevention with GRID uh, and other, uh, other resources. Moving through uh, quickly as to our public contacts. Uh, radio calls, we have an additional 35,000 radio calls this year versus last. And, and so we're seeing a, a incre substantial increase in the workload of our officers. Uh, those radio calls are up over 100,000 radio calls since 2012, primarily in the routine and, and urgent call categories. So the work uh, in the street is, is definitely, uh, we have much more service time. While crime it may be down, the, the service time, our officers being engaged and, and work within the street has actually been uh, has actually been increasing, which speaks to the issue of us moving additional personnel back to the field by the end of the year. Uh, and handguns and firearms recovered were uh, we've recovered 3,515 uh, year to date. That's an increase of nearly 300 additional handguns from last year. Uh, in regards to our officer-involved shootings, uh, we have uh, as of the 6th of August. Uh, 23 officer-involved shootings. Last year at this time, that number was 33 uh, for a 30% reduction. Uh, we have had nine fatal officer-involved shootings this year. Uh, last year, that, that was 11. 
Moving over to our traffic uh, numbers, we are seeing a reduction in our serious injuries and, and fatal injury collisions in every category but one, and that is in bicycle involved collisions. And again, this is an area that I, uh, we're asking for the public's help and assistance. We have had it, uh, 10 people this year die as a result of a bicycle involved collision. That number was five uh, uh, last year. In 2014, as a comparison, there were two people who died by bicycle involved traffic collisions. So the uh, dangers to those that, uh, that are involved in, in bicycling, uh, as well as us taking enforcement action uh, and our efforts to educate the community to provide us a safe uh, zone or allowance for the bikes, for bicyclists to exist is going to be critical as we move forward. And lastly, I'm gonna move over into our personnel uh, function as far as we have 9,977 personnel on sworn payroll 2,971 are civilians, uh, 397 reserves, and that's 1,428 cadets with our next cadet uh, post, our next cadet class uh, beginning uh, here this month. And with that, that concludes my remarks, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great. Questions of the chief? The, um, the follow-up on, on, your, on, on your discussions of the four areas, I think, is... Uh, uh, um, it's, it's terrific. It's moving ahead, and it's much appreciated. Thank you. Um, do we have any public comments on the chief's report? Yes, sir. We have eight cards. We have Mr. Herman, not present. Oh. Jonathan Foster, Paula Miner, the Red Chief Hunt. Foster. It's on the chief's report. Now that I've uh, acknowledged the 98% of excellent service of the LAPD, we got to talk about the 2% that's gross. It's gross. I want to know who trained the officers to shoot into a doorway, to shoot into a crowd. I need a name. Police protocol is is unethical, immoral, inhuman, and inhumane. It would not have been unethical or immoral to not have returned fire at the Trader Joe's incident that you didn't speak about. See, I protect the officers. See, you didn't do as I asked. I gave you the option to not have this happen to the officers. Much more training is needed and more thorough, proper concepts implemented to improve these outcomes. The police training handbook has to change. It's a wrong concept. I heard that the officer is distraught because the officer knows that he did the wrong thing. Since I walk with God, I've asked God to forgive these officers for sure. But I protected them. The, the chief, no chief or Soboroff protected these officers' heart that they got to they got to deal with this for the rest of their life. Uh, you had a police officer, a female police officer, got shot. Who protected her? Where was the head to toe body armor? is she would be, not be injured. It's been too long. The number of chiefs, another chief, another chief, and it's just, I'm ready to protect these hearts of, uh, uh, of everybody that's not on this commission. I don't, I don't care about you anymore as, as much as I've heard. You're in bed with ICE, the FBI. There's chiefs meetings get together, and then you people are still shooting people. I want to vomit so much about this panel and all these panels this is why I don't want to be an American anymore is because of how Paula Miner. Um, I'm speaking out on about two incidents that you didn't really talk about, but they did occur in the time period on the agenda um, where you said July 17th to the present, and one we found out during that per period. I'm commenting, of course, on the most recent LAPD killings where innocent non-suspects were murdered. Probably you would call them collateral damage. Um, Black Lives Matter and our allies believe that these acts were a result of LAPD's hyper-aggressive militaristic approach to policing, as shown not just by killing two 
innocent people, the one at Trader Joe's and the one at the homeless shelter in the valley, but also by the fact that your own reports say that during the past year, LAPD shootings involved more and more officers and also utilized more and more ammunition or rounds. Um, we at Black Lives Matter have been saying this during the past four years. We've raised this issue regarding the numerous murders of black, brown, and homeless people in minimally threatening situations, all too frequently being shot in the back when clearly at that point they were not threatening officers' lives. We continue to protest these state-sanctioned murders and continue to call for real transparency, not the recent edited and overproduced LAPD videos that were released. We call for clear accountability. We want to stop pretending that these LAPD murders are justified. Police are not the ones who determine death sentences for crimes. You're not the judge, jury, and executioner. The public is becoming more and more aware, as shown by the hostages at Trader Joe's, who calmed the suspect down once he was inside there, who protectively surrounded him and escorted him out of the store and then surrendered. Next speaker, please. Next speaker. The next speaker is the Red Chief Hunt, followed by Adam Smith, Wayne from Encino, and Michael Williams. Hunt's not here, so next is Spindler. Adam Smith. Oh, Smith. All right. So I don't understand how that's not a significant report part of this, part of the, your chief's report this week. You didn't mention the shooting at Trader Joe's. Um. That's kind of problematic. It's kind of problematic that last week it was canceled. There was no meeting last week. This is the first meeting. That's not. That wasn't a police commission meeting. Yeah, it was. All right. Anyway, I went to the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council meeting the other night when LAPD was invited to attend, um, and it was just. Like I, you know, assuming that they were going to talk about that shooting and feel any kind of like remorse or whatever, but it, it, it was so incredibly tone deaf. Um, I forget who was like the names of the officers or the ranks. I know one was a senior lead officer for the neighborhood, but he talked about getting back to normal. Um, and as Paula from BLM just talked about, the unfortunately the normal for LAPD is people like Elizabeth Tolleson getting killed at, outside that homeless shelter in Van Nuys, um, or Omar Magana, who was transported to Hollenbeck Station, where it appeared he suffered a medical emergency, and then he was brought to White Memorial and killed an unarmed man, killed by very armed LAPD officers inside of a hospital. So when these officers are coming out to the community and talking about getting back to normal, um, this is the normal that the community is used to. He also, he also thanked the community involved at the Trader Joe's um, for making sure that the situation ended as peacefully as possible, but <laughs> the woman, Melita Carrado was killed. Um, I had a lot more to say, but the two men that showed up that night didn't even say her name. Wayne from Encino and Michael Williams. Yes, we don't want to talk about Trader Joe's and the ongoing investigation. So a poor person making minimum wage, working at the Trader Joe's, has got to get her head blown off by incidental fire. I mean, you got a hostage situation and you're shooting into a room. You don't know who the hell's in that room. What other alternative measures could have been made? Well, first of all, you got a decision to make in a hostage situation. Is the person taking hostages capable of killing those hostages? It's a flip. It's a guess. But you're guaranteed you're going to lose one of them when you shot that bullet into that store. And that family's going to sue the shit out of the city. And, and there's no reason for it. You know, you have to handle SWAT and tactics. My cousin is on Ventura SWAT. 
All right, I rode along with this guy. One time I got the privilege of going in an FBI warrant one time. I got in second. I got to yell down, down, down. So I know what the difference between good police work and this bullshit is. And you guys have been having press conferences Friday at the city council meeting. You had all the media there. Oh, we did everything we could. Let us adjourn in the memory. The memory of what? It was a failure. You're the police chief. Admit you fucked up. Just admit it. Because you did. Now the family's going to do what? They got to go get lawyers. They got to bury the dead. They got to sue the city. They got to file a pre-suit claim and go through years of this fucking litigation bullshit while you go to federal court and admit no wrongdoing. This is what you do. Let's try a different leaf. Let's have a department of the fuck-ups. So when you fuck up, it goes to the department that fucks up. You pay for the burial services, you attend the funeral, you settle with the family and the office. Michael Williams, please. Mr. Williams. I had a question um, about talked about you put out a, a training bulletin um, after the report that came out that talked about the over uh, um, reliance on multiple police units to come onto a scene with minimally threatening situations. And you talked about this training, but you don't talk about, and I guess that's my question, is what is the, what is the punishment or what is the, the actual, like, consequence if a police officer does call in for more reinforcements than is actually needed or uses more excessive force than actually needed like what is the actual like punishment how what is the deterrent from them doing that go ahead go ahead nobody's gonna answer the no. question no okay cool um the second question is where you talked about the use of like bean bags and, and tasers and other things. Where was that use of the bean bags and taser? I know you weren't chief at the time, but where is the use of those things with Ryan Joseph, with Eric Rivera, with all these other people who have been killed by the police? There was no tasers used at first. There was no bean bag units used first. They were just shot while they were running away. In the case of Eric Rivera, he didn't have a chance to run away because he was just immediately killed and then ran over and had a car sitting on his chest, burning his chest while he was still alive. But those officers didn't receive any punishment. And so my question is, where is the use of the tasers? You, you, you talk about these tasers. Where is the use of these tasers? Will I get an answer like after this or? No, because you don't answer good questions, I know. Next speaker. No other comment cards on this item. We're now on item number. Let's go to public comment. Five public comment. We have ten cards. We have Joan Leonard, followed by Jonathan Foster, and Audrey George. Morning. I didn't know there was a two-minute limit, so I prepared remarks, which I'm now not going to make, but. I'll try to speak through. I've been intimidated by a little bit by this, but the reason I'm here is because I want to bring something that I think is important to your attention about the Van Nuys Police Station. Two weeks ago today at 6.30 in the morning, I became a victim of a crime. I left my wallet on my passenger side seat in the driveway. It was smash and run, and I wish I had heard you before, <laughs> Chief, that happened. I've had a lot of challenges in my life, and so this did not strike me as one to get particularly upset about. Things are only things. Credit cards can be stopped. Um, and I had no money in there, and I had nothing precious. I didn't cry. I didn't scream. I didn't even get angry. I actually felt a little bit sad that someone felt that they had to do this. So I went and I called my insurer and they told me to call the police. And that's when I discovered that nobody answers at the Van Nuys Police Station. I don't know if you're aware of this, but on, on July 27th, 
over a hundred times I called from home. I called the North Hollywood station. They tried to help me. They told me I could not file a police report with them because I live in Sherman Oaks. I, um, by, the t by five o'clock, I was at work. I went to work. By five o'clock, I was near tears. I, I was also behind in my work day, so I didn't get out of there until 7.30, and then I drove to the Van Nuys Police Station, something I would pr prefer not to do in the dark. There are derelicts in the street, and maybe it's a prejudice on my part, but I don't feel particularly safe in that neighborhood at night. I went in and I filed a police report. I want you to know that the statistics you just quoted, if they're about Van Nuys, can't be correct because people can't file police reports without going to the station. So your statistics may be understated. Your, Thank you. Um, and people will be calling 911 when they shouldn't have. I was tempted. You can go ahead and file a, um, a, a complaint report on that, and we'll follow up with it. I thought this was it. <laughs> no, this isn't it. <laughs> no, A, there are people here that can help you, and B, thank you for sticking around to, to make your comment. I know that this, in, this whole environment can be a little intimidating for this someone here for the first day. time. And I mean, I took it because I wanted you to know, I think this, I'm a Thank native Angelino. Thank you. And I want things to be better for everybody. Okay. So just a couple points quickly. That sergeant there will talk with you to investigate what happened on the 31st. He's walking around the corner, Leon. And then uh, secondly, we'll, we'll look into uh, the phone service, but also just to the, to the board. Uh, we are looking at uh, what in-person reports we're requiring uh, verse and the utility of that versus allowing phones uh, reports to be taken telephonically. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker. Hi. I at least want to ask Father God to forgive me just for saying the F word in the City this. Hall building and for today clock. using the SHIT word here on the microphone. Uh, if you all want to swear, I'm, I'm for you swearing if you wish to. But again, uh, this is public comment, and Special Order 40 has to go. It's, so cold in here. it's killed Jamil Shaw. It killed uh, Sheriff Jerry Ortiz. It killed Sheriff David March. You're all guilty. It's, it, it, not only has it killed some LAPD officers, it's killed sheriffs. It's killed uh, uh, California Highway P Patrol. And I'm sick of it. I mean, I'm sick of hearing about police officers get gunned down. The only way to stop the police officers from killing other people out here is to get the police department to do the right thing. And it's still very, very tough. I know people have a mental concept and they want to shoot and kill and the police have to, inter you know, interact. Okay. I have to move on to uh, the, the knife and the hostage situation. I watched the video. Thanks for putting it out. My first comments were wrong. So as they walk in, the knife wielding guy starts walking to the police officers and they should have kept him coming this way instead what they did is they shot him with the bean bag and they started going backwards they also never addressed the female to vacate the area to everybody vacate never said this they started out screaming at the top of their lungs it's wrong and where are the nets one, two, three, four, five nets, and this guy would have been all netted up, and then they could have tackled him or wounded him or all kinds of other things. And you keep talking like you're smart. That's why I keep telling you, I'm the smartest, strongest, most powerful man on earth. That doesn't mean that some six foot dude can't or six five dude can't throw me across the street. But I'm still the strongest, powerful, most most powerful man on earth. Okay, you people cannot keep up with my brain, or it, this would not be going on. But Next. it's still going on. Next speaker, please. Audrey George, followed by Gina Viola. It's my understanding, and um, I was grateful to hear it, that there's going to be a subcommittee established to investigate the SARS program and predictive policing programs, and that there's going to be an audit done of these programs. Um, I, I think it's it's just interesting how many how long Stop LABD Spying Coalition has asked to be able to present the facts to you about these programs. It took so long, and you know you have to admit it was so powerful in speaking truth to this board and to the public, and um, especially because 
before that you were you were relying on a JSS, a company paid to implement the LAPD's data-driven predictive policing programs that was quoted to say that LAPD has become a laboratory for researchers. And that's who you were using to a great extent as your subject matter expert. The program is claimed to be not racist. Let's look at the developers and promoters of these programs. Peter Thiel a prominent advisor and supporter of Trump, largest shareholder of Palantir, provider of technology that drives laser. Jeffrey Brannigan, UCLA professor and co-founder of PredPol, supports broken windows and stop and frisk approach to policing and compares criminals of property crimes to um, predators breaking, you know, to compares them to animals breaking into cars animals foraging and choosing which animal to hurt. I mean, you can't get any more racist than that. Predictive policing programs means more stops. Each stop creates harm. The trauma to the individuals of being profiled and stopped. Increased risk of, of use of force at every interaction. Incre Thank you. Next speaker, please. G Gina Viola. Gina Viola, next speaker. Followed by Adam Smith. Are, are you, so is she waving her time? Gina? I have to start out by saying that if you were truly listening, you wouldn't be so quick to jump at that two-minute mark. Several of the speakers today were really getting to their point right at the two-minute mark. And if you were really listening and paying attention, you would let them wrap up their thoughts because that's where something really meaningful was, was being said, and that's troubling. Um, I want to thank you, Ms. McLean Hill, for leaving us with a subcommittee um, to honor the work that Stop LAPD Spying has been doing and that you are leaving that behind for us. I appreciate that. Um, in the meeting at City Hall last month, the woman who spoke on behalf of the Inspector General stated that there hasn't been an in-depth review of PredPol or, or LASER. We demand that these programs be dismantled, along with SAR, and an audit be done to identify what impact has occurred so that the affected communities may receive reparations. This audit shouldn't be done so that these programs continue these audits need to be done to find out what damage and harm has been caused. I, too, have only been coming to these meetings for about a year. And what I've learned, one of the things I've learned about predictive policing is that all it has done is to create a frightened police force, quick to pull the trigger, in a mall, in an apartment complex, outside of Trader Joe's. What you have is a police force taught to fear their jobs, so that they shoot first and cover up second. How many times has video footage gone missing when it doesn't suit your narrative? You speak to video footage getting released quickly only when it corroborates your side of the events. We have missing video footage from Waukesha Wilson 22 minutes in a jail cell. We know that's important and it's gone forever. Also spoken about at City Hall was the need for officers' privacy. What about the community's right to privacy? What about a one-year-old's right to privacy? Next speaker, please. <clears throat> Who's next up? Adam Smith. Mr. Smith. So um, going back to Melita Corrado, uh, with any due respect, Mr. Sobrov, you all could call that meeting two weeks ago a regular commission meeting, but the truth is there was no other than the presentation, agenda item, and public comment, there was no official um, chief's report. And if today's report is from the 17th, it's kind of disingenuous to, you know, say we talked about it two weeks ago. Mr. Smith, I'm yes. sorry you feel that way, and it wasn't meant to, to uh, obstruct. I've made no secrets as to the department's involvement in that event, we, and uh, I feel for that loss, uh, as does every member of this organization. Thank you. Okay. I mean, it just goes to dismissing us for bringing up, I'm not saying that statement right there is dismissive, but in general, um, this commission is dismissive of us when we bring up things like this, so.
Um, I too am thankful that the audit of SAR is happening, there's a subcommittee happening, and that Laser and Predpol um, will be audited as well. I wouldn't go so far as to say I'm thankful in specifically to you, because I feel like that's the explicit job of the commission is to call for these types of audits that Stop LAPD spying have been asking for for years. Um, so, you know, I guess com commending you on finally doing that part of your job on your way out. I hope it's a lesson to the rest of you to maybe step up and do something. Um, I got 30 seconds. One thing I noticed at the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council is that the mayor's crisis team was there to speak to the community and reach out to the community. There was a woman that was um, offering free mental health uh, therapy with area doctors. And I'm just wondering, um, is that offered to like the people at the mall when Grishario Mack was killed or to the people at the homeless shelter when Elizabeth Tolleson was killed? The next speaker, John Avalos, followed by Wayne from Encino. Morning, sir. Hi, how you doing, how you doing? Four quick points. Um, the water and the coffee, the rule that we can no longer bring water and coffee. It's not being consistent. I just, I snuck my, my water, my coffee today. I don't know, I don't know how I did it. I don't know how. And it, I get cramps if I don't have my water bottle. I get cramps. And right now I was getting cramps. Number two, online, I wanted to find out if there's a meeting today. So last night I was online. It's still very difficult to find out if for sure there's a meeting. Last week, I didn't do that. Instead, I came over here. And you moved over there to the city hall. And there I was trying to get to city hall. It was so hot. That online doesn't, doesn't help us to find out if for sure there is a meeting or not. Number three, oh, oh, oh good, I'm halfway there. Number three, um, the venues. I've, I've been bringing this up before. Why cannot you do consistently one month, one time, one time a month, have your meetings in the community so that we know when they will be coming, the meetings? Because we need some youth here. At the, we need college students, high school students to come and experience. And experience. This, is, this, is, this makes you hunch down because the, the microphone is like this. It needs to, you need to fix this mic. <laughs> please, please. The venue, please. I like coming here. The, the high school Working kids now, you must have fixed here. It. Thank Can you. you have the meetings at night here? This is okay, but also in the community. But right now, coming over here in the morning, it's so hard. Number four, fourth point and last one. Why is there a police magnet academy at a junior high school right there on York and North Figueroa? Why? That neighborhood right now is changing fast. So it, it's not a good signal. It's not a good signal. Wayne from Encino. So last speaker. We have three more. We have Bridget, Brown Bay, Hamid Khan, and Ivy. Okay. So I heard uh, Cynthia McLean Hill leaving, and they're going to put some old, white, half-disabled, mentally idiot back from the Christopher Commission. They're going to stick this old, half-dead weasel in the chair. Have you read the paper, Spindler? <laughs> The uh, guy's uh, an African American. He's, he's a younger lot younger than, than you. He, he, he's <laughs> white. Goddamn, two minutes and start he, again. He's white. He's whiter than you. It's two minutes back. Because you you turn these motherfuckers white. That's the whole point. See, see, but you had to force Cynthia out. She she didn't go your way. She stood the fuck up to you guys. And then I I read that letter from the LAPPL. That was a threat. I read that letter. And then they do another shit to her. So. I really appreciate Cynthia being on this commission, putting up with these fucking morons, because, you know, you're surrounded by a bunch of lowlifes. Now, Steve, you can have $2 billion, he's a lowlife. And then you got uh, the other one there, Shane, won't take care of her brother. And then you got the other one over there, the little weasel that keeps going over to the Garcetti. 
that uh, Figueroa, you'll see her over on the third floor. Oh, Eric, we did this today. Oh, Eric, we did that today. Oh, Eric, we did this today. It's little Eric's little pimp. So that's why Cynthia moving on. You're getting yourself out of this low life situation. You got too much class to be around this kind of trash. Now, the rest of these guys get paid. Now, you can't blame T. Fang. He get paid. You can't blame the city attorney. He get paid. You can't blame the guy over here that don't say nothing. He get paid. Everybody getting paid. That's it. But they ask you to volunteer for this crap. You can't take no more of it. It's over. You can't stand it. It's time to go back to human beings. It's time to go back to living like a human again. And that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. I want to move to Ventura County and get my boat and learn how to fish. I want to go and get out of here, too. So that's why I need my settlement from the city. Then I can get the fuck out of here, too, and do what Cynthia is doing. See how it works? You evolve. You come here de-evolve. And then you re-evolve. And that's what we all do. So good luck. Decompress and get the hell out of here. Try a GoFundMe page. It might work. Bridget Brown Bay, Hamid Khan. Hello, I'm Bridget Brown Bay. I was here June 20th and told you guys about the problem that my family and I are having with these folks. I didn't bring the microscope, even though it's in the bag. I do still have pictures. If you don't see wires, you're not seeing straight, okay? This came out of my head, everyone. <coughs> I have microscopes. Now, what happened was June 20th, I came, and I stated that this was going on, that this was happening to me and my family. I asked for help. What I received was mental health and a child custody case. I came to ask for help for me and my children, and now they decided they need to take them because I asked for help. So I have child custody, I have mental health, I have about six mental health detectives and all come to my house. <coughs> my question is, with these executive orders from your president stating that this is happening to the American people. These are executive orders from Trump stating that this is happening. You sent everyone to my door except for someone to help. I would like to know when is the help going to arrive? When are you going to come and see the cameras? For each person that entered my house, I said I could show you the camera, show you the motion sensors. No one wants to see it. They said we're not here to disprove you. So when is someone gonna come to prove that what I'm saying is true, it's real? When is the help gonna come? I don't need any more mental help. I'm not crazy. That's what y'all want us to think, that this is crazy, but this is real. And your president has said so. So I would like to know when the help will arrive and not mental health. Hamid Khan, please. Well, is this the last speaker? And then it's Ivy, and then that's the last speaker. So we've, uh, we're going to be having an audit of uh, the SAR program, which we, uh, the last at least four audits have shown clear evidence of racial profiling, particularly uh, how the black community is being impacted. We're going to have an audit of uh, predictive policing and the PRET poll and laser program. Uh, but I think we, sh we can't stop there. We've got to hold their feet to the fire. Number one, we've got to make sure that the audits are thorough and detailed. We did provide the Inspector General with a clear outline of what areas need to be audited. But what's really concerning and which has gained a lot of international attention as well, and by the way, the other day at the public hearing, we had uh, media from, from England, we had media from Spain, we had media from Canada, who've been looking at the reports, because one thing people are extremely, extremely concerned, which may be outside the purview of the Inspector General, 
is the whole intellectual framework that informs and guides these practices. We talked about Edward Banfield, who pathologized and demonized the community and gave us broken windows policing. We talked about Jeff Branthingham, who equates the community to savages and gave us fretful. We talked about Craig Uchida, who claims that the community is tumors, that these people are tumors, and gave us the laser program. So I think when we talk about dismantling and abolition of these programs, it's not just based upon the operational impact, it's based upon how the community is perceived, how the presumption of guilt is, is, and the assignment of criminality takes place. It's that presumption of guilt, it's that pathologizing of the community, it's that demonizing of the community that has been the tradition of white supremacy. And I think it is that tradition that we are exposing. It is that tradition that we cannot allow these programs to function. Audits are good because they expose things, and we hope so. And we hope that, Mark Smith, that you really Last speaker, please. Ivy. Ryan Joseph, say his name. Ryan Joseph. Hmm. Ryan Joseph, another unarmed young black man, shot several rounds by your officers. No justice, no indictments, no convictions. I'm just like I'm listening to the discourse in this room during this meeting and all the other meetings I've been to, and it's so apparent that we really need to double down on our efforts to just dismantle and dispel the language, the vocabulary that you all hide behind, the vocabulary of power that you use. I, it's very clear to me also that the LAPD and the police are structurally violent and racist and have a historic role in perpetuating slavery. Mass incarceration and police brutality are the civil rights issues of our time. And slavery was abolished, as does this institution of policing and incarceration. We need to see that. And I'm committed here to ending, ending the tyranny of the police in this room and beyond and of state violence everywhere. I want to thank all the active folks in this room and organizers for struggling to think of a world we can reach beyond policing, beyond killing our brothers and sisters and our neighbors. This meeting is also extremely unaccessible to working class people in this city, working class poor that need to be in this room. It, we need community meetings at different times that we can all attend. <clears throat> Do we have any um, comments on the closed session items? Yes, sir. We have four cards on 6A1, one on B, and one on C. Let's do 6A1. Okay, we have um, Adam Smith, Michael Williams, Joseph Michael Williams, and Wayne from Encino, and Gina Viola. Anybody? So Ryan Joseph was shot in the back. Um, have an idea of how the uh, closed session is going to go for him. And it's unfortunate. But um, as I bring up, I've only been coming for a year. And, you know, I look at, try to look at the closed session names every week. And, and the corresponding dates, and it's usually around 10, 10 months to 12 months from the forest investigation. Um, and I've commented many times in the past that the report that ends up coming out after a year is basically what the chief, in uh, the cases I'm talking about, Chief Beck, said, you know, word for word in the, his chief's report the following week. So I don't understand what happens in that year that actually is investigated, but I'm wondering why this one's taken... 20 months. Um, 
and I know, Chief, you weren't Chief, but what's the criteria for, you know, making a family wait 20 months, making the community wait 20 months for to figure out why LAPD officers shot a kid in the back? Six A one, Mr. Williams. I just want to remind everybody who's thanking Cynthia McLean Hill for doing some audit that already has been audited and not even committing to shutting down these programs that she voted unanimously with the rest of the people on this board on Lucretia Wilson's murder being justified. <laughs> but I'm off topic. <laughs> Ryan Joseph, I, there's really nothing less to say to you people. Like, there's really nothing less to say to y'all. Like, the, you guys do this every week, and I, I know you guys are going to come back and say his death was in policy and that murdering people is a policy that is within the p police department. But this young man was killed, and I don't even know, I mean, we never know why his family is not here and if there was any real effort to making sure that his family could attend this and hear their fate of their child. There's, like, there is no, you guys sit here and you guys say you're sorry or you guys say whatever, but you still continue to do these things. And there is no real evidence that you guys are actually doing anything to make it stop you guys do reports and investigations and you do all this stuff without any real change and that's why i don't come here anymore because it is useless it is useless to be here and Cynthia mclean hill the best thing you've done since you've been on this board is leave because all of you just rubber stamp death after death after death after death after death after death, after death. when Everyone who looks at it with an objective eye that is not a part of the police department can see that they were murdered in cold blood. I hope you're all proud of yourselves for defeating this community and defeating because you guys really don't do anything and there's no point of coming here and talking to you. Wayne from Encino. <laughs> Go ahead. Right. So that's it. The last death that Cynthia McLean's going to reside over. The last death. Yes. So you go back there. She have to vote yes. It's within policy. She have to vote yes. Because if any of these motherfuckers up here votes no, it's not in policy, then they send the LAPPL and protective services, the FBI, the Treasury Department, the State Bar, they send all of them on your ass. And that's why they're gonna sit in those fucking seats, go back there and vote, the cop was within policy. They know it's not true. They know shooting the fool in the back is not public policy. It hadn't been that way since Caesar got that knife in his back. Backstabbing, back shooting ain't the way to go, fool. But you, this is what you have to do. And that's why, that's like Cynthia McLean wear pretty clothes. That's why she have her hair all nicely done. Because you got to live, you got to have the money to live high class. And the only way you live high class is to do what Master Soboroff and Mr. Trump want o you to off do. Topic. Goodbye. Where's my microphone? Okay, okay. Then my microphone. I don't want to make my massa mad. So, yes, let's go ahead and lie, shall we? Ryan Joseph was turning his back to the cops, and he magically was going to point a weapon magically behind his back and magically kill these two cops, and these cops had to defend themselves by shooting them in the fucking back. Right? Right. Gina Viola. I 
just wanted to leave with a moment about Ryan Joseph, who was shot in the back. Um, and I echo everyone's sentiments that it is frustrating to get up here time and time again and ask for your consideration and transparency in this, but I'm here again. Ryan Joseph had a chance at life, and it was taken from him. And do your jobs today, please. And we demand transparency on what happens in those, those meetings where you find things in policy. It is so difficult to continue to give people hope that something is actually going to occur the right way. And that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, then we have um, Wayne from Encino on item 6B and Wayne from Encino on item 6C. All right, here we go. All right, we're going to try Chief Charlie Beck in absentia because he's not here anymore. So now, Walter Moore trying to stab his old buddy in the back. Yes, sir. So we got unknown complaint 17-00-1946. We don't know what it's about, but it doesn't matter what it's about, right? What's important is one thing, that you're going to go and you're going to do two things. One you're going to take Charlie Beck's pension away, or two, he's going to get the money. But if you go against Charlie Beck, he got those five thumb drives. All your dirt on all your personal shit. Mr. He got President, it all. He's off topic. And that's off why topic. Charlie Horse Beck is going to be acquitted, and he's going to be released and given a perfect performance evaluation like every 33 years of that old man's life. Yes, sir. Off topic, let's go to number C now. Yes. We might as well finish up. It's about, it's about the Charlie horse back. <laughs> yes. Now, do we know what this is about? Of course we do. He sold his horse to the city for a profit. That's right. And you're still bringing that up. And that's wrong. Now, Charlie is retired. He's living on his horse ranch. <laughs> and he's not going to come back here again. Don't worry about it. All Charlie Beck wants is his pension and his badge of honor. He wants to keep his gun concealed weapon permit for life. He wants to stay there topic. with okay. it. Well, let's, let's uh, go ahead and adjourn. The Board of Police Commissioners will now recess into closed session to discuss item number 6A1, B, and C in accordance with Government Code 54957. Yes. The Board of Police Commissioners has concluded its work in closed session. We are back in open session. In closed session, item number 6A1 was discussed and the Chief's recommendations were unanimously adopted. In closed session, item number 6B was adjudicated and in closed session, item number 6C was adjudicated. Mr. President, is there a motion to adjourn? So, second. All those in favor?
Hello, it's time again for Adopt a Pet Today, sponsored by the Pet Care Foundation. And today, we 